I'm a very skeptical person, so I don't usually get caught up thinking random people are out to mess with me. But this scenario just caught me off guard. Everything made sense, and it nearly made me shiver when I realized it all in my head. I work from home, and my sleep schedule gets pretty backwards at times. This means I usually find myself getting hungry in late hours of the night. At these times, usually past midnight, only a couple of places are open. One of these is a 24-7 Carl's Jr. slash Green Burrito restaurant. It's the closest 24-hour fast food place from my house, and I like their fried zucchini, so I find myself going there a few times a week. Whenever I go there past 1am or so, there's always this same guy alone. Never have I been there late, and there has been a different worker. He's pretty tall, I'd estimate at least 6 foot. Somewhat slim and probably in his late 20s or early 30s. Anyway, it was around 2.30 a.m. when I decided I was going to the 24-7 Carl's Jr. for some food. When I arrived, they played the usual pre-recorded promotional offer, and I said no thank you. Then the guy on the speaker asked me if I could pull up to the window. While I've never been asked this over a working speaker at any of the fast food plays, it didn't really strike me as out of the ordinary. I pulled up to the window, and before placing my order, that guy, the one that's always there alone at this time, asks me if he can just change the battery on this device really quick. I couldn't really tell what it was, but I'm guessing it had to do with the ordering system possibly. After a few minutes, he comes to the window and asks for my order. I order a jalapeno double cheeseburger and a side of fried zucchini. I give him my card, and after a minute or so, he returns it. Now I've ordered this exact same thing over 20 times, at the exact time, while the same employee was working alone. Every single other time I ordered it, he had finished it in a few minutes at the most. Never did I have to wait longer than that. The first thing I noticed was it was taking longer than usual. I had probably been waiting about 10 minutes at this point. At least twice as long as I ever waited for this fast food meal. That's basically already prepared. Then I noticed something a bit strange. When you look into the window where you pay, on the right side is the indoor counter with the cash registers, and on the left side is the kitchen area, with a dim window allowing you to see in. A couple of minutes before I received my food, I saw the guy do something on the far side of the room. I found it odd as he spent a couple of minutes there, and it looked like he was messing with something small. All of the food prep stations were in the room to the left, and if he was putting the burger together, I expect I'd see a lot more arm movement. This is the first thing that seemed a bit strange. This is where it gets really weird. I've ordered the same thing from this same guy quite a few times, so the past few or so he's thrown in ranch into the bag without asking me. As he starts approaching the window with the bag of food, I turn over and as clear as day, See him grab one single ranch and toss it into the bag. It wouldn't be until later that this detail became really creepy. I drove home, brought the food into my room, sat at my desk, and started eating as I watched shows on my computer. Beside the food, he also put in some napkins, a couple ketchup packets, and exactly three ranch cups. I opened up the ranch cup so I could dip the fried zucchini in it. After a little while, I finished the burger and most of the fried zucchini. There were only a couple left, but the ranch was gone, so I decided to open another. This was the moment. It hit me all at once like I was watching a good mystery show, and I finally got the telling hint. This second ranch cup opened much, much too easy. I've eaten a good share of fast food in my life, so I've opened tons of these cups of sauce. So when the plastic seal slid right open without any resistance whatsoever, I immediately knew something was off, and that important detail came rushing back into my head. I, 100% clear as day, as the guy was approaching the window with the food, saw him grab only a single ranch and throw it into the bag. That memory was the first thing that came to my mind when I opened the second ranch cup. I quickly grabbed the third and last ranch, and I already knew what was going to happen. The plastic peeled right off, 
even easier than the first cup. Instantly, all I could think about were the details. This order, the same order I've gotten 20 times in the past that took 5 minutes at the most, every single time, took an entire 15 minutes this day. After about 10 minutes or so, I see the guy in the very back of the counter area, messing with something small for a couple of minutes. It doesn't seem like he's preparing food because he's only making slight movements with his arms. When he approaches me with the bag, I see him grab one ranch cup and toss it into the bag. Not only am I sure I saw this, I'm sure that he put sauce into the bag on two different occasions, as there was also ketchup in the bag. And even if he somehow grabbed three ranches, it definitely looked like one. He didn't also grab any ketchup at the time. I was looking right at him. I know this all may sound coincidental, but I can't stop thinking about it as it makes sense. Well, too much sense. Even though I saw him only throw one ranch into the bag, it never surprised me when I saw three ranches and a few ketchup packets in the bag. That's why I trust my response to opening those other two ranch cups. The ones that opened way too easily. So easily that the realization that they'd already been opened hit me like a ton of bricks. If this is all possibly true, and he did open those ranch cups, it must have been what he was messing with on the counter in the back. Maybe that's where he was using some kind of adhesive to seal them back up. But what none of this can truly answer. What did he put into my food? I didn't actually tear the seals completely off the two suspicious ranch cups, so I actually taped the tops down with gaffer tape. I put them into a plastic bag and into the fridge. I know it sounds silly, but if he really did try to put something into my food, I might be able to figure it out with those. Even somehow being able to tell if there's a different adhesive than the normal one used to seal those cups. That would mean it was tampered with. Needless to say, I'll never be eating there again. I'll probably start trying to cook more. I worked at McDonald's for most of last year. Our McDonald's was one of the popular ones. So we had the speakers, pay window, and food window. I worked pay window. The pay window is simply a small office or cubby in the back of the kitchen. Just you, the window, and your screen. One night I was working pretty late. It was past 10. A coworker was clocking out behind me, and I was cashing out a man in a work van. He was obviously on the job or heading home. The company decal was on the side. He had a large reflective jacket on and safety glasses perched on his head. He had short brown hair and looked to be about 25, I'd say. He didn't look suspicious in any way. Now, I am dead serious when I tell you I have never met this man in my life. After ringing him up, he changes his mind about our cookie promo sale. He looks me dead in the eyes and says, Yo, Maddie, can I actually buy some more of those cookies? My coworker hadn't said my name or anything while he was at the window, and we don't wear name tags. This man had no reasonable way of knowing my name. Again, I've never seen him before. He didn't even look familiar. I asked my coworker behind me who was about to leave if they heard what he said, and they confirmed it. I didn't catch the company phone number. I told an older coworker what had happened, and we swapped places so I was back on grill. It was pretty weird. It wasn't necessarily threatening, but it was enough to spook me. The truly unnerving part was him looking me in the eyes when he said it. Christmas Eve dinner at Burger King. Sounds innocent enough, right? Not my first choice, but I had to work late and being Christmas Eve, it looked to be my best choice. I finished working at 9 and had some coupons for Burger King, so that made my decision for me. When I got to Burger King, I noticed it was still open, but the dining room was shut down. The only way I could get something is if I went through the drive-thru. The only problem is I don't have a car. 
I try to walk up to the drive-thru and place my order, but the compassionate young lady working the drive-thru wasn't having it. She told me if I didn't have a vehicle, I could not use the drive-thru. I became rather aggravated and began saying things I'm not proud of. At this moment, an older woman wearing shining armor appeared on the scene and offered for me to jump in her car and order my food. At first, I turned her down, not wanting to be a bother, but after some convincing, I decided to accept her help. After ordering my food, it took so long to get it that I missed my bus and got upset. The nice woman offered me a ride home and I felt kind of put off by the offer and declined. She was persistent, but at the same time nice and convinced me to take her offer. Mind you, I'm a 250 pound 30 something man, so I really didn't feel that threatened by a 50 some woman. If the circumstances were different, I would not have taken the ride. After I told her where I lived, we proceeded home. About five minutes from my house, she gave me a wrong turn. I explained that I lived the other way and that we would need to turn around. Roy let me out here and I'll walk the rest of the way. It was then that this woman's demeanor changed. She told me that she couldn't let me spend Christmas Eve alone and that she was taking me to her house. I told her that I needed to get home immediately to let my dog out and that I would be fine. The woman then tried to entice me with drugs and alcohol at her place. But since I'm in recovery, I told her I wasn't interested. She refused to turn around or let me out and started to drive strangely, not stopping at signs. I'm not going to lie, my mind was racing and I began to sweat. I knew that I could physically overpower this woman, but what awaited me at her house? I also felt bad about hurting her after all of her kindness, but I had to get away before her house, and I didn't know where that was. I didn't know how much time I had. Then all of a sudden, luckily, the car in front was stopped at a stop sign, and across from it, another was stopped also. She had to slow down almost to a stop at this point, and this is where I made my break. I jumped out with the car still moving, leaving my food in the car and I took off running. As I was running away, she stopped and got out of her car. She began to try to talk me into getting back in the car with her. That just wasn't an option. I don't know what her motives were, or who she was with, but I knew I wasn't willing to risk my life over it. I ran all the way home and made sure I wasn't followed. What would have happened to me if it was two years earlier and I was still doing drugs and drinking? Her offer of drugs and booze would probably have worked, so would it have been a kidnapping, murder, sex trafficking, organ trade, or what? Being a man, the thought of vulnerability most women face every day was so foreign to me, and now I understand the fear most women face. I really feel this nice woman had a nefarious purpose and that I just so happened to be the perfect victim of opportunity. My mind races. Thinking, wouldn't the ruse of such a non-threatening bait just be perfect to lower the guard of a prospective victim? I never went to the cops because I felt they might not believe me, or they might look down on me for being scared. What if by me not reporting this, ended up with someone else getting hurt? I could just be jumping the gun and coming to conclusions. For a bit of background, when I was 16 or 17, I worked at a local Tim Hortons store for some extra cash. Nothing too unordinary, just a lot of old folks coming to get their coffee and morning office runs. It wasn't until I started covering midnights for people on the weekends is when a strange man started appearing randomly. It started with him picking up money from the drive through lane, which is, by law, illegal. He was talked to and stopped picking up the change. But at night, in the drive through cameras, there was always two pinpricks of whitish green lights coming from the garden, and whispers in our headsets that none of us would admit to. I always thought it was my co-workers playing tricks on me. I mean, we had a lot of jokesters. The whispers would say things like, I will skin your bones. You'll enjoy your last bagel. I always got a bagel on break. It made me shiver at the thought that someone was always watching, but again, it was most likely my co-workers. The man became bolder. He started ordering weird things like a biscuit not toasted with butter, 
but then he wanted it toasted and soaked in coffee. One night, he came in with blood on his shirt, and when we asked him if he needed first aid or an ambulance, he just said that he needed to pee and that he was fine. My supervisor called the police right away as she came in from changing the outside garbage and was bawling her eyes out. She asked me as the phone rang if anyone had come inside and I said, yes, he went to the washroom but I think he's hurt. She screamed as she realized it wasn't his blood. She told the operator, I was changing the outside garbage when I saw a man lying on the sidewalk. He was caked in blood and not breathing. I think the killer is in the bathroom. The police department was no longer than five minutes away, and they dragged the man out of the washroom. He was completely naked and trying to touch himself with the blood of the man he killed. I threw up when he started to get very aroused and finish. The store was closed after that, and from what I know, it wasn't an aggravated killing. And even worse, it did not hit the news. I'm not sure why these things never hit mainstream news, but I feel like it's the company covering it up. Around about 10 years ago, my kid and I were driving back to Alberta from Oregon after visiting family. As was tradition, we stopped for an early lunch at the last Burgerville for however many miles to circle the globe. After making it through the drive through the kid announced he needed to pee. I pulled around and parked in front of the doors next to a silver sedan. If you turn right after entering, a glass hallway takes you to the toilets. I let him go alone because I could see him and I needed to arrange some things in the car. There was a middle-aged, rough-looking guy sitting in the sedan reading the paper. He noticed me and struck up a conversation. He asked the usual, where are you going, where are you coming from, type of questions. I'm smart enough to be vague, but I did have foreign plates. Being polite, I asked him the same questions. Turns out, he was just driving around looking for work. He's a grave digger and looking to stay in the field. He then asked me to get in his car and help him read the ads. I demurred. He got out of his car and walked around to mine, and he noticed my foreign plates. He started asking me if there were grave digging jobs in my area. He's standing between the cars by the back doors, and I'm leaning on my driver's side door. Thank God at this point my kid comes dancing along the glass hallway and out of the Burgerville. He's being extra goofy for whatever reason. I yelled out, did you get it all out? As he opened the door. The grave digger went rigid and sped to his driver's side door and jumped into his car. I got my kid strapped in and took off. Luckily I always get lost getting back to the I-84 after stopping and ended up taking a circular route back to the highway. I hit the merger lane and pushed the car to 90 miles per hour. I didn't stop until I was running on fumes. This whole thing would have just been weird if it hadn't been his reaction to seeing the kid. I have no doubt he was up to no good, and my goofy ass kid saved me. When I was 16, I had just got my first car and had it about three weeks. This guy walks up to me at a gas station and asks to use my phone. Naive and trying to be nice, I let him use it. But he walks away for a minute and then walks back with an older guy. I didn't know at the time, but he had taken my SIM card out of my phone. Then they got into the back seat of my car. A friend of mine was in the front. This guy asks if I will give them a ride up the street. At this point I was kind of nervous and just wanted them gone, so I thought this would get rid of them. It was literally like a minute drive to this bar, so I figured okay. I'll just do that and then get them gone. They were kind of intimidating, especially to 16 year old me. But as I started to drive, he says take this right and go to this road, which happened to be the road I live on. So I thought, cool, I'll drop them off and be right back home. Well, I get to the house they wanted to go to, but then another guy, a thugged out guy, gets into my car 
and they say take us to a Wendy's and bring us back. It was like five minutes away, so I figured I would get these fucks their Wendy's and that would be it. So I take them through the drive through get food, and start to head back to my house. But he says no, take us up the street. At this point I tell them, is this it? I need to be getting home. He says yeah, just drop us off. It's like five minutes away. I still haven't gotten my phone back, by the way. I'm too scared to ask for it by this point. And to be honest, that's the least of my worries. So I drive and get to this dirt road. Really freaking out now, we come to an area surrounded by trees. Kind of a circle, but big enough to turn around. So I start to turn around because there's no house. And at that point, he reached up from the back seat and throws my car in park and then he grabs me. My friend jumps out and tries to run. One of the other guys gets out and hits him, but I guess he got away. It was dark and hard to see. Then the man pulls out a gun and tells me to get out. I'm fucking scared. Really scared. I think I'm about to die. He hits me in the mouth with the gun and tells me to give him everything. I had some money in my pocket and I hand it to him. They all get into the car and drive off. I'm miles away from anywhere and I start walking. No phone. Freaking out. I called out my friend's name and hear nothing. I walked a few miles to a gas station and cops are there. I guess my friend made it there and called. I called my dad and told him what happened. It was the scariest moment of my life and I should be dead. My face was all busted up and we get to the police station. I tell them everything. They think we were buying drugs from these guys and are trying to get me to tell them who it was. Then they pull out a book of pictures. After like 30 minutes, I see the one who hit me. I knew it was him instantly and told them. A couple of weeks later, I hear that he stole another car, got pulled over, ends up stealing a cop car, then is chased down. He gets out tries to cut across a train track with a train coming, falls, and it severs his leg. Justice was served, but it doesn't end there. Years later, I saw him at a bar. He had crutches hobbling around, and I was so satisfied. Then a couple of years later, he got hit by a car one night and was killed. I know this is hard to believe, and whether anyone believes me or not, I don't care. It's very true, and I should be dead, but I'm not, and he is. I was about 13 to 14 years old when this happened. I was alone, just slowly walking home after seeing a few of my girlfriends off. It was getting late and outside looked a bit dark. I guess maybe it was around 7.30. I'm about a block and a half away, about to walk up and past a bus stop, when a bus pulls up and opens its doors to let off passengers. I think nothing of it and walk past an older man. He's in his 30s and the only person getting off. As I said before, I'm taking my time walking, so I'm not immediately spooked when I hear him singing closely behind me. I'm just thinking to myself, he's probably just trying to get past me as the sidewalk is really narrow. So I pick up the pace enough so the guy doesn't feel like I'm blocking him or something. But even as I'm walking faster, it seems he quickens his pace right along with me. At this point I take notice to what song he's actually singing. To my complete stomach flipping nausea inducing horror, he's singing old school love songs. I walk faster and he just keeps on matching my pace. At this point, he's singing louder the faster I go. I'm panicking right now. I'm absolutely certain this weird man is following me. I'm trying to walk faster, and he's right on my heels. When we get to the sidewalk in front of my lawn, I then take off in a run past my lawn and up the steps onto my porch. Of course, I don't have my keys, so I'm frantically ringing the doorbell and banging on the door for someone to let me in. I look back and the guy stops walking and stands on the sidewalk in front of my house, just staring at me. I'm absolutely terrified, thinking about what his motives could be. 
Nothing good, obviously, but just how debased and perverse. He then says, I wasn't trying to scare you. He keeps eye contact for a second and then continues to walk down the street. I was sick to my stomach with anxiety. I'm sure he only stopped because it was clear I was going to cause a scene. I'm hoping that he just thought I ran into a random house for help. Otherwise, this guy knows where I live. My little 12 to 13 year old sister comes and opens the door for me. She was the only one in the house. I sometimes think how things might have ended had he seen who opened the door. This happened about nine months ago. I'd been driving around by myself listening to a podcast and was getting hungry, so I stopped by a McDonald's drive through This particular McDonald's was next to a little strip of stores with a big parking lot, so after I got my food, I pulled into the parking lot to sit and eat. It was probably like eight or nine, so it was dark by this point. There weren't too many cars in the parking lot, but I had parked in the corner away from other cars anyway. Minding my own business, I see a convertible with its brights on pull into a parking spot directly in front of me. It was a row away. Immediately, I expect the lights to turn off and the person inside to get out and go into one of the stores or whatever, but they just kept their car on, with their brights shining directly on my car. I thought it was a bit weird, but I tried to ignore it. Then the man gets out of the car. I couldn't see his face because of the darkness and distance he was away from me, but he looked to be in his 40s or 50s and wore a dress shirt tucked into his dress pants. He gets out of his car and just stands there. He's looking directly at me. I get a weird shiver on the back of my neck and I make sure my doors are locked. All of a sudden, the man looks down and reaches for his pocket, starts fumbling around and then looks back up at me very quickly. Then he goes back into his pocket, looking for God knows what, and then quickly looks back at me. He does this a few more times, and instead of being like, maybe this man has a gun, taser, or knife, I was just frozen, watching him continue to fumble around in his pockets and stare wildly at me. I'm full on starting to panic at this point, wondering what the hell this guy is doing and why he keeps staring at me. Then, out of nowhere, the man starts to swiftly walk towards my car. I wasted no time in whipping that shit into reverse and getting the hell out of there. It creeps me out to this day when I think about it. What the fuck was that guy gonna do? Due to a multitude of factors, including a recent death of a close friend of mine, I was unbearably depressed at this time in my life. For that reason, my family flew across the country to visit me in LA, where I live. We thought it would be nice to visit Catalina Island. When we arrived, it became more apparent to us that it was the off-season. It was late November, the weather was cold, and as a result, the island was nearly empty, besides locals and a few staggering tourists such as ourselves. Our first priority was to ditch our luggage so we could explore the island. So we immediately checked into our motel, though the word hardly does the place justice. I called a motel because all the doors to the rooms exited to the outside, but in actuality, our room was one of 20 to 30 quaint guesthouse looking buildings arranged in a sort of horseshoe shape around a walkway with rooms on either side of the path. The entrance of the motel was essentially one of the points of the horseshoe, and if you walked dead straight, you'd reach the room we were given, essentially on a corner before you have to go right to go further into the horseshoe. So from our room, one path led back to the street, the other further into the secluded maze of rooms. Stay with me. After a day of exploring and just having finished dinner, it was time for the cold, dark walk back to the room. Catalina Island is a decent distance from the mainland, and let me just say, it gets dark. 
Similarly dark was my headspace after the dinner conversation took a left-hand turn, and my overwhelming depression got the best of me. I pulled my black hoodie tighter over my freezing ears and walked ahead with my parents to the hotel room, telling them I just needed to go to sleep. And I did, immediately. Depression sometimes makes that easy. I was already losing consciousness as they entered after me, drifting off without so much as a good night. I then woke up to my mom saying my name, a harsh whisper. The room had two beds, my parents' bed closer to the door, and mine further into the room. My mom's voice cut through the silence again. She sounded concerned for me. I didn't blame her, considering my mental state at the time. Groggy, I rolled over. What? I asked. As my eyes adjusted to the dim moonlight coming in through the curtains, I saw her turn to face me. She was surprised to see me in my bed. Her eyes got wide. If I'm in my bed, who was she talking to? We both looked back where she had previously been looking to see a hooded figure in all black standing over their bed. Understand how horrifically startling it is to be on an island in the middle of the ocean and wake up to see a hooded stranger looming over you. This moment seemed to last forever. Life isn't like the movies where characters unleash a blood-curdling scream. Sometimes the only thing that comes out is something panicked and guttural. My mom's words became low and severe as she said my dad's name in a dire voice I've never heard her use before. Then the hooded figure did something so bizarre and unsettling. It didn't advance towards us, but instead crouched in the corner near where it stood. The way it crouched was so absolutely unexpected. Even in regards to this already unexpected situation, it terrified me. It seemed animalistic. I knew two things. The hooded figure had been standing over us while we slept, and it's not acting in any sort of way that I can understand. As opposed to the infinite moment of this figure standing over us mere seconds ago, the series of events that unfolded when my hulking, ex-military dad woke up happened in an instant. Suddenly we were out the door, not knowing which way the intruder went. My mom was screaming, Get him. Get him. My dad was running down one path of the horseshoe, further into the hotel, shouting through the sheer adrenaline, I'm going to fucking kill you. I ran down near the path toward the street. When I got there, not a sign of the intruder, but it became suspiciously quiet behind me. I ran back to my room to find my dad quietly walking back, his head low. He gets really close to me and I say, it's a fucking kid. So here's an explanation. Some young teen, tall and lanky as I am in my 20s, wearing all black, including a black hoodie, went into the wrong room. Our room. The one time my parents just so happened to forget to lock the door. My mom woke up when he entered, and seeing a tall person in a black hoodie, thought he was me, assumedly leaving the room in a depressed episode. And when the hooded figure crouched, that was him realizing his mistake and panicking. He was scared of us. As I got back to the room, my mom walked out and hugs this kid, who's now crying his eyes out. I would be too if a massive ex-soldier was sprinting after me with murder in his eyes. So, to the now traumatized kid from Catalina Island, I look forward to reading your Let's Not Meet of this same event from your perspective. It was Christmas time. My wife and I were staying at her childhood home, where her mother now lived alone. The house was in a quiet cul-de-sac in the suburbs. If you're picturing freshly mowed lawns, American flags, and empty sidewalks, you're picturing it right. It's a single-story home with an attached garage out front. The garage has two doorways. One leads to the garden and backyard. This had an old, doggy door from the days with dear old Max. It was covered with a piece of nailed-in wood 
that had always made me slightly uncomfortable before, but I figured it had been that way for years, so what's the worst that could happen? The second door leads to the kitchen, hollow core. It could stop a mouse, but nothing else. Definitely not something that wanted in, or someone. We were asleep in my wife's childhood bedroom at the front of the house at 3am. I was in that deep, dark recess of sleep. You know, you're in the diving bell, and you're submerged hundreds of meters below the surface in black water, protected from the real world by miles of nothingness. And then I heard it. The scream. What are you doing was screamed. It was my mother-in-law's voice echoing down the hallway. To me, lost in a sea of sleep, it sounded like a jet engine roaring past my eardrum. I bolted up. What happened next happened in a matter of seconds. But about the scream, even though I was dead asleep, I heard enough of it to sense an urgency behind it. This wasn't an, oh you scared me type of scream. This was different, and I knew it. Not consciously, but my lizard brain. That piece we retained from our primitive ancestors knew something was wrong. I watch and read a fair amount of true crime, and this scream awakened that horrible fear. The one that says, this really can't be happening to me, can it? Honestly, in that second of the night, it sounded like someone was about to be murdered. Let me ask you, have you ever wondered if you're a fight or flight type of individual? I always have and I came to know something about myself after this night. I'm a fighter. I leapt out of bed, growled, yes, growled, in the manliest voice I could muster. I'm gonna kill you, you fuck. And I took off running. I tore open the bedroom door and ran into the hallway. There, at the end, I saw my mother-in-law, nightgown on, look of utter shock on her face. Standing still, we make eye contact as I continue toward her, then she turns her head, looks directly into the kitchen. I hurry past her and round the corner into the kitchen. The hollow core door is obliterated, shards everywhere. I look through the open frame and see that the electric garage door is open. I push ahead. As I run into the garage, I hear it. The sound of someone hopping into a car just out of view. Just as I make it onto the driveway, I see a car peeling out from the sidewalk adjacent to the house, but the adrenaline is still pumping, and who am I to say no to adrenaline? So, like an idiot, I run, barefoot, after the car. I give a good go, but I'm no Michael Johnson, and even he couldn't catch a speeding car. It soon vanishes down the street, and I'm left all alone. The police showed up within three minutes, which, I have to say, makes me feel a lot more at ease with my mother-in-law living there. They took our statements. My mother-in-law said she heard a noise, the hollow core door being kicked in. She then walked into the kitchen where she encountered the burglar, a small framed woman. The police theorized she was working as part of a team. Her job was to squeeze through the doggy door, kick in the hollow core and then open the garage door for her accomplice. According to the police, the burglars most likely thought nobody was home. Fortunately, my mother-in-law must have caught her off guard and scared her, but it feels good to know that everyone was safe, and to learn that I've got a bit of fight in me. And, for the record, we bought the heaviest wooden door you've ever seen to replace the hollow core. I'd like to see a mouse try and get through that. This story happened a few years ago. I was in my early 20s and was studying in Paris, France. I was going home from uni. I usually took a short bus ride and walked the rest of the way. That day, I felt slightly uncomfortable. I could sense some guy looking at me intensely. I was used to unpleasant, unsolicited gazes, but this time, his gaze felt beastly. It's hard to explain why, but I felt like prey being stalked. I decided to get off the bus a few stops early 
I wanted to avoid him and didn't want him to see where I usually got off. Like I learned in the movies, I waited until someone else pressed the stop button and waited until the last moment to stand up and leave. I didn't notice him getting off the bus. Just as I was feeling the relief of having escaped an uncomfortable situation, I looked over my shoulder and there he was, a few meters behind. I had the distressing feeling his eye had just looked away the moment I turned. I walked into a shop, took out my phone and pretended to be on a call. When I couldn't see him anymore, I exited and made my way home as fast as I could. I kept looking back in the busy street. I zigzagged, crossed the street at every crossing. Finally, I believed that him getting off at the same stop as me was just a coincidence. When I reached my building, I looked back one last time, and there he was, his alarming gaze on me, smirking. I ran up to my apartment, climbing the stairs four at a time. I reached the top floor, squeezed through my door, locked it, and froze. My intercom was ringing. Don't ask me why I picked it up. I regretted it the moment I did. I could hear the opposite flat intercom ringing as well. He had pressed all the buttons one by one, hoping someone would open. But now, he knew my name. Gabrielle. Oh shit. I felt like a deer in headlights, frozen. Open the door, please, said a pleading voice. I just want to talk to you. Somehow, I couldn't move or speak. Come to the window, he added. Look at me. You'll see I'm not a bad guy. Something clicked. He wanted to locate my apartment in the building. I was not going to make that mistake. I hung up in shock. I waited by the door without moving for what seemed like hours. When I finally managed to calm myself, I called my long-distance boyfriend. Call the police, he said immediately. Why didn't I call the police? I don't know. Today it would be the first thing I would do. The fear of making a big deal out of something not important, perhaps. What an idiot I was. I called my best friend instead. I didn't want to feel alone. I told her all about it, and after a while I felt better, safe. We started ringing, and suddenly the intercom rang again. Two hours had passed since I'd come home. I answered. Gabrielle, said the voice. Open, please. I still remember the chills I felt. He was still there. He was there all this time. I was silent, petrified. He was silent, but I could sense his trepidation. Gabrielle, let me in. I'm so thirsty, he said. Just give me a glass of water. This broke the tension. I hung up. Curled up in the corner, literally in a recovery position, terrified. I waited. I was scared to make a sound. I knew he couldn't hear me from the hall, but I was scared with every breath. The intercom rang again, and again. I didn't answer this time. I crouched to the sofa and fell asleep in exhaustion. I heard the intercom ring one more time in the middle of the night. I woke up in the morning, afraid to leave my apartment. I called my dad, who came to pick me up. There was no one in the hall, but there was a note in my mailbox, and it said, Gabrielle, I'm a nice guy. You should have opened to me. We immediately went to the nearest police station. The police listened, and of course told me I should not hesitate to call them. My dad called a locksmith to install a digicode on the building door the same day and wrote a message to each of my neighbors asking not to open the door to anyone they did not expect. He sat in the cafe in front of my building with two friends every evening for more than a week. I never saw the stalker again. After this episode, I used a different route to and from uni every day. I kept my phone tightly in my hand and looked back every few meters. Today, I'm still very observing of my surroundings. I never answer the door if I'm not expecting someone. So, people, 
If you ever find yourself in any kind of uncomfortable situation, call the police. Don't be an idiot like me. Be safe, everyone. I'm moving, and I was talking to a guy who lives on my street about the move. I offered to give the guy an unwanted sofa and other items. He offered to come up to my unit to pick up the items, but my instincts told me not to let him inside. I thought maybe I was just being paranoid, but okay. We organized for him to pick up the sofa and items this evening, but as I told him I wouldn't be home, I would place the stuff outside my unit for him to pick it up and leave instructions when he arrived. My apartment complex is quite large, and the entrance covers any view of the individual unit entry. This guy's not been told which unit I live in. He's due to come this evening, so this morning I carried the sofa down the stairs. I bring my dog downstairs for a walk with the additional items to place with the sofa. I was intending to take a photo of the location and text this guy with the information for pickup, so I'm looking at my phone. Then my dog does a small growl and there is this guy. He was not told when I would put the items out. He didn't know which unit was mine. How the hell did he know when to turn up? I grabbed my dog and quickly left for a walk. It was just so creepy. Trust your gut, people. I'm 26 and I live in the northwest of the United States, about a four hour drive above Salt Lake City. I'm gonna sum this up a bit. I have religious people come to my door from time to time, mostly Mormons. I am always polite to them and listen to what they have to say and say no thank you at the end. One day I had three guys come to my door, I think they were like 16 to 18, maybe older and wearing nice dress clothes. They said they were Mormon and started off by stating they were trying to get a law passed to increase taxes for unmarried individuals versus married couples. I stated taxes are already higher if you're single. They asked what I did for a living and if I felt loved and accepted. I replied, I'm in college pursuing my bachelor's degree, and yes, I feel loved, and I'm not always accepted. They said they know what it's like to feel like they're not accepted and that their group could help. Their group has love, and since I'm not married, they said they could have a husband arranged for me. They said I would get to pick a husband from five different suitors of their choosing, and I would never have to work a day in my life, and I'll never be lonely again. I could just be a housewife, and wouldn't have to do their 18-month recruitment as long as I produced a child within two years. I said I already have a significant other, and I'm not lonely. So they asked if we we're going to get married within six months because they could have me guaranteed to be married within that time period. And I said, I don't know. That's not my decision to make. We're content where we are. They told me my significant other can also have another wife to assist with the housework so I'd never be overwhelmed. I told them we're monogamous and fine with where we are. They said he could come work for them and he could go to trade school paid for by them. However, he would have to give 10 to 50% of his income to the church to go to food banks, health care, and anything we would need. And then they said, or you could entice an outsider into joining us. But if you've become married and decide to leave, you will be cut off from the church and everyone. No, thank you. I'm not interested in joining your group, I said. That's okay. If you want to join, we'll be around, they replied. My significant other told his co-worker who's Mormon about it, and he said that yes, Mormons take 10% of your income to help with food banks and those in need, but nothing like that. It must be a cult. I have seen cults on TV like the Heaven's Gate cult or the crazy ones that get busted by the feds, but I never thought I'd come in contact with one. They were holding their hands together and very persistent the entire time. It was all just really creepy. I wonder if this was a cult. I'm 
I was at home alone in my previous apartment in a not so great neighborhood. My apartment was on the ground level and my bedroom window faced a back alley. A dumpster sat less than two car lengths away where homeless people often rummaged. Just before dawn one morning, I heard a tapping at my window. My back was to the window and my eyes were now wide open. It was still dark outside. I slept with my lamp on and my worn out vertical blinds were missing a slant, creating roughly a six inch gap. So I knew that whoever or whatever the source of the tapping was could see me lying in my bed as plain as day. The tapping was brief, maybe five or six taps, so I spent the next five seconds or so frozen, bizarrely trying to convince myself it was something or anything else but a person watching me and tapping on my window. But then came more tapping. Now, I was faced with the terrifying reality that someone had been watching me through my window in the dark for God knows how long, and he decided to tap on the window. Had one of the homeless people become aggressive during one of their dumpster dives, I thought. Something told me that nothing good would come from turning around and looking at the window. If he got me to look at him, what then? Remember, my back was to the guy, so I sat up slowly, rubbing my eyes and pretending I was too groggy to hear him. I stood up and, hazily, made my way out of my bedroom, as though I were going to the restroom or something. Once I was out of his sight, I ran to the phone to dial 911, considering whether to forget any embarrassment of being in my t-shirt and underwear and bolt out of my front door, which was out of sight from the intruder. I just wasn't sure I could outrun whoever it was, or whether anyone would help me if I couldn't. Before I could make a decision, I heard a loud pop of my window. It was the sound of it being pried open. I thought my heart would jump out of my chest. At that time, I could hear my upstairs neighbor Mike descending the stairs. I opened my door a few inches and peeked out to ask for help. Mike was a big guy and I'd heard he was trained in martial arts of some sort. He didn't hesitate to respond, hustling to the back of my apartment to see what was going on. Within a few seconds, I heard rumbling and someone being thrown against the wall and into the bushes. A few moments later, Mike came around to my front door, telling me not to worry about seeing that guy again. He'd beaten him up pretty badly. I wanted to believe Mike, that the would-be intruder was maybe dumpster diving, but that he would never venture this way again. But it wasn't a homeless person. According to Mike, when the guy escaped, he ran to the front of my building, hopped into a red sports car, and sped off. My neighborhood wasn't a red sports car kind of place. The police later told me that the intruder was likely someone who'd seen me out somewhere and decided to follow me home to find out where I lived. So, Mr. Window Tapper, I still wonder what you would have done if you'd gotten inside before Mike caught you. I wonder if you'd still follow me, and because of that, I often find myself wishing that Mike put an end to you. So I bike about 10 minutes and take the bus to work during the week. I'd spent the weekend with my in-laws, so I didn't have my bike with me last Monday and had to walk after the bus got me to my closest stop. I had a 20 minute walk. Basically, it's all residential and numbered by streets, so I get off on say, 50th street and walk to the 40th. When I first start walking, there was a black car that was on the other side of the road driving slowly and pulled off to the right next to someone's driveway. I didn't think much of it and kept on walking. When I got to the next street though, the car is doing it again. I walk faster and try to watch for it. It followed me most of the way there, finally turning off a side road. I didn't recognize the person in the car, but I noticed it was an older man. I started freaking out. I already have agoraphobia, and when I bike in the mornings, it's dark out there. I can't help but feel like I'm being followed. Trafficking is a known thing here, and I'm a female. 
I don't know what I should do. I need to get to work, but biking and walking is the only way I can afford right now. And I'm scared of next Monday. This happened during the summer of 2015, and I had just graduated high school. I still lived in my hometown. I was out with some friends and it was getting really late, like around 1am or so, so I decided to head home. I stopped by a drugstore close to my house that was 24-7 to pick up some aspirin and snacks. The one I went to was in the same parking lot as a supermarket. I parked my car close to the store and it was empty. There were no more than two other cars in this giant parking lot, and I was nowhere near them. I head in and grab what I quickly came to get because I had this overwhelming feeling of dread the whole time. I felt like someone was watching me, but I couldn't see anyone else there besides me and the cashier. Then after I'd gotten everything I intended to buy, I stalled checking out and just went aisle by aisle looking at random things because I thought whoever was out there would leave if I took too long. Really, the whole time I thought I was being paranoid because I wasn't used to going out late. After 20 minutes of that, I pay and leave the store. I get to the door and literally bolt to my car, my pepper spray in hand, and I lock myself in. I turn my head to check the back seat, and right before I could breathe a sigh of relief because no one was there, someone tapped on my window. I looked around before I left the store near the entrance, and no one was around my car. So how did I not see a person there? This is where I really freaked out. This was odd. He was a very handsome blonde man with slightly longer hair and a cast on his arm. Now my first instinct was to drive off, but he was leaning on the front hood part of my car and I didn't want to hurt him. So I rolled my window down just an inch so he could speak and maybe back up a bit so I could drive off without hitting him. But no. He stayed glued to my car. He then asked me if I could help him with directions and look up an address for him. I said, I really need to go, sir. Maybe ask in the drugstore if they can help. Already went to the supermarket and they couldn't help, he said. The supermarket closed at 8. There was no way this guy had just been looking around for 5 hours waiting for some random girl's help. He then went on about feeling really tired and if I could just give him the water or food I bought since he had no money. I said okay and began to reach to the passenger side to grab the chips I got. I began to roll down the window slightly and like I had expected, he moved closer to my window. But he was now off the car so I hit the gas. He chased my car and I heard a scraping sound on the side as I pulled away. I didn't drive directly home in case I was followed. I drove down the highway for an hour because I was so distraught over what happened. I finally got home and the entire side of my car had been scraped from the door almost to the trunk. I'm really sure he used a knife or something else as shot because it was a really rough scrape. I reported the incident but they never found him or any of the similar incidents in my town. He was watching me the whole time, maybe from the windows of the store because how else would he have known I bought food? I also think he hid behind my car so I couldn't see him when I came out. I feel like he was trying to get me before I got into my car, but I got in too fast. Here in South Africa, when we were in lockdown, I meant to travel for work to Santa Barbara, but since we were under lockdown, we couldn't go anywhere. So I'm an entrepreneur with a tech startup here, and since I travel mostly, I make use of the Regis co-working space for a hot desk or meeting room. It's quite flexible, there's always coffee and pretty girls coming in and out. Since the pandemic broke, however, I saw Regis as a public or corporate office with many people coming in and out. Therefore, I was stuck with no office. A buddy of mine told me he has an entire unused area at his house behind some offices. I would be alone. I'd have my own entire kitchen, lounge, 
couch, TV, bathroom, that entire thing. But the catch, I would have to park on the road. So let me explain the way the road is. It's a wide, steepish road with a massive park and zoo on the left, with three entrances and parking, and some houses and businesses on the right. I use this road quite often to go to Florida Road, a popular bar and food district. There's only street lights on the houses and businesses side. As there was a red line or no parking line alongside the road on the right and left, I had to park outside the park. So I parked in the first parking spot nearest to the building I was at. This story takes place one night before the lockdown. I had a call with a company in Denver, Colorado, which meant I had to start at 6pm South African Standard Time. It went well and I decided to pack up and leave. I wore formal shoes and carried my laptop on my back. Being paranoid, I looked on the CCTV before opening the gate. I didn't see anyone outside. I then proceeded to buzz myself out, lock up and walk out. I don't know how, but in the time it took me to walk from the building to the gate, a man had appeared. He seemed drunk or high, and just hanging around the fence on the side of the road my car was, wearing a hooded sweatshirt with a hoodie down, torn brownish jeans and sneakers. I started walking and looked down keeping track of him from the corner of my eye. Mine was the only car left, so I would assume he knew that was mine. As I got closer to my car, I noticed him start to walk out toward me. I ignored it. He was still walking diagonally, trying to cut me off. He then said, as he was maybe five meters away, let me help you with your bag, sir. Now, I had a comfortable laptop backpack on, I was walking hands free, and yet he asked to help me with my bag. In South Africa, car guards usually help you with your grocery and expect a tip of 5 or 10, but not this guy. This guy knew what I was doing, where I was going, and what I was carrying. To make matters worse, he had his left hand in his hoodie pocket and was now walking faster. It all went down in a split second. He suddenly lunged at me, but being a football player, I feigned left and went right. In that split second, I thought, if I ran to my car, which was still another 5 to 10 meters away, I would have surely not made it. I am fast, but fumbling with my keys, opening the door and getting in, I didn't seem confident. So I made the decision of jumping the fence into the now dark park. I made it with one leap over. As soon as I hit the ground, I took my laptop bag off, held it in my hand and ran. I looked for a dark spot to hide so I ended up being behind a massive tree in the park. There were a few of the trees, but it was the only one that didn't have a light hitting off of it. I heard the man running and slurring his words, saying something like, Piss, just give me the bag. So my car was on the other side of a tennis court. If I could get to the tennis court, sneak around that, and run to my car, I would make it. But there was a lit open space between this tree and the tennis court, and that man was running straight through that space. I watched the angle of him running, and slowly rounded the tree to keep myself out of his line of sight. I honestly think him being high helped me immensely here, as he ran straight past and toward the other side of the park. When he was a distance away, which couldn't have been more than 20 meters, I made a break for it. I pushed away every branch and leaf, which he heard and turned around and saw. I burst around the tennis court. I turned around and saw him yelling and running back at me, stumbling every now and then, but picking up the pace and actually gaining on me. He had a knife, and it was out now. I puffed my way up the hill, opened the car and jumped in. I locked the door with my laptop on my lap, and started my car. When I looked back at the darkness, he was gone. He must have slunk back into the park when I was out of range. But where? I didn't wait to find out. I skidded and drove the hell out of there. I won't say I won't work there again. I would. But maybe I'll Uber next time.
Growing up, my parents were the stereotypical overprotective immigrant parents, but after that encounter, I understand why. I'm the youngest of three, and I have an autistic older brother. We are fairly close to the same age, so we did pretty much everything together when we were children. I always took care of my brothers in general, but I always kept an extra cautious eye for my older brother. My mom is the strong but nervous type, always trying to think ahead, trying to do the right thing, trying to protect her own. An incredible mama bear who never tires. She taught me never to trust strangers. Don't get into someone's car you don't know. Never follow someone you've never met before who tells you that mom or dad has sent them to pick you up, she said. She would always have a meeting with our school to allow me to travel by bus with my brother. In the end, even if I didn't have permission, the bus drivers were so nice they let me tag along with them anyway. So, with that said, in primary school, we would always take the yellow school bus to go to and back from school. One day, as usual, the bus dropped us at the end of our street, and we had to walk to our apartment. Usually my mom would open the door for us, even if my oldest brother was home. She never let us answer the door when we were kids for obvious reasons. That day, however, my parents weren't home. We were ringing and knocking, but we never had any answer. A car eventually pulled over in front of the building. Luckily, we had a relatively long walkway that separated the sidewalk from the stairs, so they couldn't get to us easily. Suddenly, a woman came out halfway from the passenger seat and waved at us, probably to signal us to approach. While she was gesturing, the rear door opened. That's when I realized she wasn't alone. I couldn't correctly identify who the person was, since her overall shape wasn't familiar, and the car was a little far from where we were standing, so I went down a few steps to slightly approach them, but I just couldn't recognize her face. I really felt uneasy, so I took my brother's hand and we started running. Pure instinct, and the voice of my mom in the back of my head, imagining her reprimanding me if I took the risk to approach these strangers. It was winter, and we stumbled on ice, but we were quick enough to get up and keep on running. I'm actually not even sure if my brother understood the whole situation. He is still a smart cookie, even with all of his difficulties, so I always wondered. Mind you, we weren't even 11 and 12 years old at the time. Yes, the car chased after us, but they weren't able to catch up. We arrived fairly quickly to the neighbor's house. The car sped off when my neighbor opened the door, which made the situation even more, well, accurate with what I thought. It clearly was a kidnapping attempt. When my mom was made aware of the situation, she almost had a heart attack, feeling like she could have lost us. She spent days afterward calling everyone she knew to ask if the strangers were in fact just family or friends. No one came that day. And even so, they'd always call to be sure we were home before passing by. Everyone was dumbfounded. But the story doesn't end there. Few weeks before this incident, we were getting a bunch of random phone calls with no one at the other end. It would ring at 2 to 3 in the morning, 6 in the morning, or in the middle of the afternoon. It happened so frequently. But being a child, I never really felt any red flags from these phone calls. At most, I found them annoying. A few months ago, I put all the pieces together. My mother was especially protective and always on alert mode, probably because she knew that someone was trying to see if we were home alone when they called. I think those people were watching us for a while before trying to take action. I don't think we just happened to be alone when they were passing by. I don't think the phone calls and the right timing is a coincidence. Shortly after the phone call stopped, we moved out of the apartment a few months later, and we never had anything like this happen to us since. Growing up, I always wondered what would have happened if the bus drivers weren't nice enough to let me ride with my brother. Would he have gotten into their car? I'm actually grateful I was with him that day. I can't imagine what would have happened if he was alone and targeted 
by those monsters. This was four years ago in the summer. I had a co-worker I was friends with, and he asked me to hang out at around 11pm. I told him I was busy and had to walk my dog because I wasn't really in the mood to hang out, but he ended up convincing me anyway. So he gets to my house and we drive to this park like 10 minutes away. We sit on the swing set and talk for a while. We end up talking about some creepy stuff, so I think we kind of spooked ourselves from the content of our conversation naturally. A bit of time later, I suggest that we both go to a drive through and we both get up to leave the park and walk to his car which is parked on the side of the street. As we're walking, we notice this man also walking on the sidewalk. We both mention it to each other how we saw him in the park earlier, since we were already a little creeped out, but we didn't really think anything else other than that. So if I remember properly, the man was walking past our car down the sidewalk, and we were walking straight to get into the car. We were like six or so feet away from him, when he turns around and starts walking towards our car. My friend hadn't even had the time to unlock his car before the man yelled out, Are you fucking serious? We both had no clue why he'd be yelling at us, so we kind of just stood there frozen beside the car doors. I started to jiggle the passenger side door, and then I look at my friend, but the guy started to get closer, so we knew we had to run. I can't explain how our thought process worked in this moment, because we weren't saying anything to each other, but our instincts both kicked in after the initial shock of this guy yelling at us wore off. My friend ran down the same way the guy had been walking before he turned around, and I ran the other way. The guy chased after my friend, and I kind of half-jogged, half-stayed in one spot, trying to figure out if my friend was about to be killed by this crazy-ass guy. I screamed in their direction I was going to call the police, but the guy didn't even skip a beat and kept screaming. I'm a girl, and my friend is a guy, so I think naturally he wanted to get the guy away from me. But in that moment, I genuinely thought my friend was going to be killed, and the guy would come back for me after. Keep in mind, we were on a street on the one side of the park. There were houses all lined up on this street. And not one person called the police or came outside to ask if we were okay. My flight kicked in, and I ran behind someone's house to hide in the backyard, and then I called 911. The funny part is, after explaining the situation and how we were being chased by a guy saying he was going to kill us, the 911 operator asked where I was and told me I need to leave the person's backyard because I could scare them. I'm literally hiding so I don't die, and the 911 operator said, No, go back in the line of sight so you don't stand in someone's private property. Anyway, I hear my friend yell my name, and it took me a minute to come out. But finally, I did. My friend told me the guy ran off. The police showed up a bit later. They took our statements and didn't seem really too concerned. The police officer put his searchlight on his cruiser, and just drove around the area. Literally after the police left, a woman came out of her house and told me she saw the whole thing. She told me that the guy was screaming that he was going to do sexual stuff to our corpses after he killed us, and she was scared for us. Anyway, that's my story on how you think when you're being chased by a madman who's saying he's going to do stuff to you and murder you. You'd think that other people would care. No. They just stay inside their house and don't even call the police for you. Please take this as advice to always watch your own back. Never expect other people to have your best interests in mind. Nobody cared about us, and we were teenagers running for our lives by a park. People are assholes, and most of the time bystanders, making them nearly as bad as the guy chasing us. And also, yeah, the police didn't really give a shit either. Private property is more important than my life.
Several years ago, I was 19. I was studying in college. During the exam period, I would always go to the public library in the city center to study. They would have special places for students to study. This particular day, I'd gone there with a classmate. It was a weekday and I finished studying about 2 p.m. I asked my classmate if she wouldn't mind if I left. She said no, so I packed my stuff and left the library. As I walked out of the library, I walked straight into the city center. As I left, I felt something brush up against me. Considering that I had just walked out of the quiet library and into the crowded street, I brushed it off. I proceeded to walk through the city center to get to my bus stop. After about five minutes of walking, I couldn't seem to shake that feeling that something was too close to me. So I grabbed my phone, held it up, and looked into the screen to see if there was someone behind me. And that's when I saw this man, about in his 40s, walking behind me with his eyes set on me. I felt uncomfortable because he was giving me weird vibes. He just looked off. He was walking with a limp while staring right at me. He was wearing a scarf with a suit jacket, really old track pants and some old gym shoes. I didn't think he was homeless or a junkie. He was just... weird. But to be safe, I put my phone in my bag, and I put my bag over my other shoulder, away from him. That's when he walked up to me and started walking next to me. At this point, I've been walking for about ten minutes through busy streets. He kept his eyes on me and was walking so close to me as if me and him were walking together. Once I almost made it to the bus stop, I saw my bus drive off. I didn't want to wait for another bus at the bus stop. I didn't want this man to wait with me or know which bus I was taking. I decided to continue walking to the central station, which was about eight minutes away. As I crossed the street, I noticed this man kept walking and didn't cross the street. I felt really relieved and pulled out my phone to text my mom that some weirdo had been following me for about 15 minutes at that point. Not even a minute later, this man comes running out of an alleyway right in front of me. I almost tripped when I saw him and he kept walking in front of me. Every 10 seconds he would abruptly turn his head to look back at me. I'd even made a small snapchat video of it. At this point I was so nervous but I was almost at the central station, so I just kept going. That's when he stopped, turned around, and started talking to me. I saw you at the library, he said. I didn't respond. We were together at the library, he repeated. Again, I ignored him. He didn't get the hint and kept talking. Hey, where are you going? Are you going to the central station? I'm going there. I'm going to take a bus. Which bus are you taking? At that point, I'd had enough. There were people walking by and nobody said anything. So I just ran straight to the central station and got on my bus. I sat behind the bus driver just in case this creep decided to run after me. I saw him looking around before getting on his bus. Once I was on the bus, I finally had a moment to think about what happened and I realized that this man had been sitting there, at the library, watching me for hours, waiting for me to leave to go after me. I remember feeling uneasy all the time, but I ignored the feeling, thinking it was just nerves before the exams that were coming up. This experience really made me uncomfortable, because I'd been going to that library to study for years. Even in high school, I would study there until 9 p.m., and leave by myself in the dark. I can only imagine what would have happened if I had met him then. This happened 18 years ago, before I had access to cell phone and internet. When I was 15, I had walked from hospital alone to a bus stop. I knew I had at least 15 minutes to wait and didn't look forward to it. When a man in his mid-thirties started walking beside me, he was uncomfortably close, but I was young and, thanks to my upbringing, avoided conflict with adults like the plague, so I decided not to offend him and just bear with it, telling myself he's just walking in the same direction, and he was. 
but not to take the bus, as I soon found out. Once at the bus stop, where we were all alone, the guy started talking to me, opening with questions about bus schedule. I stayed rather passive in the conversation, only giving polite nods and yes or no where it was expected, and he probably liked it, because he perked up and entered an almost manic-like state of happiness, talking about his life and job and everything. Gradually, he started talking about how he's unable to find a girlfriend, and how he's watching his neighbors who slighted him, and writing everything down to get them later. He had a good chuckle on that. The alarm went off in my head at that. The bus was now approaching, and it became clear I was going to board it, and that he was not. He snatched my ticket before I got my wits about me, and I thought he was going to destroy it to prevent me from boarding. But no, he wrote his phone number on it and gave it back with an attitude of benevolent generosity. I boarded the bus and thought I had seen the last of him, but no. Weeks later, he boarded the same bus as me. He immediately approached me and casually asked me whether I was going to school, having my backpack on me and not being used to lying, I said I am. He asked me, are you going to university? I gave him an awkward look and said, I'm 15. He seemed quite surprised, but not about my age. He thought he gave me a compliment, because apparently being older is what every high school kid is craving. I got off the bus at the next stop, because that's where my school was. He didn't follow me, and another passenger who overheard our conversation told me, you shouldn't be talking to men like that. I didn't know what he meant. He was roughly around the same age as the guy. So I just mumbled something and off I went. A week later, the creep stood in front of my school, waiting for me, all dressed up. I saw him before I walked out of the school doors, and the chill went down my spine. I didn't know what to do. I went to grab the school director and told him about my encounter. He went out and dealt with the man, and thankfully he must have gotten the message because I never saw him again. Years later, I understood he must have stalked me ever since the walk to the bus. He probably checked out the schedule and wrote it for weeks to get another chance encounter, and then he deduced where my school was at. He most likely wanted to manipulate a minor into a relationship since he wasn't able to initiate one with an adult woman. I think he was convinced he was going to be successful. This was about seven years ago. I was living in Wyoming at the time. I started sleeping in my truck to save time when I had a double back for work. Between the hour drive home and back through a blizzard and only five hours in between work, it seemed like the best option to get the most sleep. I have a full-size truck, enough room to sleep in the back comfortably with a sleeping bag. I felt the safest parked at the hospital. There was enough police presence in and out that I didn't really worry. My windows were tinted so no one could see me back there. One night, I was relaxing in the driver's seat before crawling in the back. The window slightly cracked since it was quite cold out. When a man walked up to my driver's side door and stopped abruptly as he passed my hood, realizing I was sitting there. I always have my doors locked because I'm that paranoid true crime buff that doesn't want to take a chance. But double checking, I quickly glanced down to check. I kind of cracked myself up a bit, thinking that this guy looked like Fester Adams. I thought he was going to walk on. I was wrong. He just started asking if I was from around here. I tried giving short, one-word answers, hoping he'd get the hint. He was creepy and odd. He started telling me his stories about running from the law and rambling on about what crime he committed here and there, but it didn't really make any sense. He reminded me of a drunk, telling tall tales. I started getting weirded out, 
the whole time wondering, why is the parking lot so dead? Why did I park so far from the door? And regretting responding to this guy, he still went on. He was now asking me for a ride. I told him I was waiting for someone, so I couldn't. I don't remember how the conversation ended, but I was weirded out enough to move spots to sleep. He walked on slowly. I noticed the police that usually frequent the hospital, and I wanted to tell them what happened. But what really did he do wrong? Just a lonely straggler that has tall tales to tell. Who am I to judge? Nothing really creepy about that. Now fast forward to the next night, which I finally had off and was relaxing watching TV. When I flew out of my chair in disbelief, as the same face I saw the night before, now featured on America's Most Wanted. Wanted for murder and a list of things, matching the stories he was telling me. I did call to report. It was a long winter of driving back home every night. Hopefully the most wanted Fester Adams was caught. This happened about eight years ago. I was reminded of this by my stepdad retelling some memories of camping. Although this may not be the scariest of stories, if you've experienced trauma from an injury, it doesn't take much to set it back off again. So, my stepdad and I would head up to the mountains to hunt for elk season. It was a glorious getaway from cell phones and the daily grind. We packed up our wall tents, four wheelers and rifles, and headed up into the deep wilderness, where we met up with other close friends. Usually there would be about seven or eight of us camping in wall tents, equipped with large enough wood stoves to heat a small cabin. Our camp was pretty organized. We had a race trailer converted into a cook trailer. It's bear country up there as well, so you gotta be cautious. Most of our tents were 15 by 15, very spacious. Many nights we heard the sounds of wolves howling in the back of our field, passing through. If there was a bear near the camp, the horses would let us know by stomping and snorting. Of course, I always had my tent close to the horse corral, so any time they snorted, I freaked out, but it deterred the bears away. All in all, the three years up there, things were going smoothly. We had two-way radios to communicate with everyone in case they needed help or got lost. The one person that did was a cop friend one day, but he made it back to the camp before too long. While he was my friend, he was staying in my tent, since he was new to camping with us. The temperatures usually hit 10 degrees on most nights usually, so we were nice and toasty if we kept our fire stoked. We all turned into bed one night, stoked the fire, added a couple of things of coal to make a longer burn, opened the flue to reduce the smoke and let the fire breathe. Once nice and toasty, you could get into your pajamas and sleep. Well, I am such a paranoid camper, I sleep in my day clothes with my boots ready to go. Normally, I'm the only girl in the camp, but this year our friend brought his wife. So as my friend and I said our goodnights and turned off the lantern, we started to hear a girl scream, terrifying painful screams. Within seconds, my friend was up and out of his sleeping bag, pistol in hand, and he yelled, Bear. I popped out of my sleeping bag boots on, and reached for the rifle as we listened to the screams. We unzipped the tent, both armed and ready for the possible grizzly intruder in the camp. But what we saw was no bear, but our friend's tent fully engulfed in flames. They couldn't get out. Everyone from the other tents pretty much came rushing out all at the same time, placing their firearms back down and running for the tent that was engulfed. They were surrounded by four walls of fire, with only moments till the roof collapsed on top of them. A couple of the guys started to try and rip the burning tent open so they could get out. These tents were completely floor to ceiling, no break in the fabric, so they couldn't just lift the bottom and crawl out. A couple of the others were grabbing water jugs to slow the fire down. 
we all started pulling the tent away from the trees to free them. In the darkness, water jugs and fuel cans look all the same. Thankfully, as my friend grabbed the fuel can, thinking it was a water can, he realized as he reached the glowing blaze what color it was. As we all started yelling to him, it's red, it's red. We finally got the girl out, but he was still inside as the roof was giving way. We managed to pull the entire tent away from the combustible items and get him out as well. Once the flames were all out, they were driven to the hospital. Thankfully, they were okay. We think an ember got through the stack that caused it. If you waterproof a wall tent with rain seal, remember they burn extremely quick. After that, we had two different spots in camp for fuel and water jugs. I skipped the next year hunting. This happened a couple of weeks ago. I've been training my five-month-old German Shepherd puppy to be a psychiatric service dog for myself due to PTSD caused by trauma. For a while now, I've been wanting to take her to the river to see if she likes to swim. She loves thrashing the water out of her kiddie pool, so I figured she would love the water. There are a couple of nice waterfronts where we live that I thought would be great to take her to. I'd been waiting for my husband to have time to come with us, but that hadn't happened. Finally, one afternoon, I was tired of waiting, so I checked my Google Maps to see how you'd get down there and noticed it really wasn't too far off from civilization. As a female, I always try and be cautious, and with PTSD, my brain is always looking for danger. It was around noon and a perfect sunny day to head to the water. I started heading up to the entrance road. It looked like any other park. I drove around a bend or two, and after about half a mile, I could see the bush before the water. There were cars parked off to the side in the dirt parking lot, where you could ride your bikes or walk on top of the ravine. We finally got to the gate to turn in, and I was turning slowly, reading the signs before I pulled in, just to make sure dogs are allowed. No one is behind us as we turn in. One side of the gate is closed, allowing only one vehicle in and out at a time. I saw that there were well-kept soccer fields on each side of the parking lot as I was looking at the scenery. I looked up to notice a medium-sized pickup pull in behind me. I was still going slow at this point because it was my first time here, so I pulled to the left to let the truck pass. Just note, there are three little parking sections containing ten spots on each side. So I was pulled over in the first lot, but I didn't park. I let them pass and pull back onto the road to head down to the water, which is at the end of the third parking lot. I watched the truck ahead flip around and head back out, and I didn't think too much of it. He probably changed his mind. As he passed, he gave me a death stare. Now my dog was still laying down, so the only thing he could see was me. My truck windows are illegally tinted, so you can't see through my side windows. I thought he was leaving, until he flipped around and got right on my tail. I continued on, making a what-if plan. We were now in the second parking lot, so I started to pull into a parking spot, leaving myself enough room to go forward so as not to get blocked in there. He started backing up into a spot on the opposite side of me. I waited for a second to see his next move. Because of my PTSD, I tried to assess if this was my mind being overly cautious, or was I listening to my gut that I've always trusted. I went with my gut and turned my truck toward the exit and slowly moved forward attempting to get a number plate and description just in case. As I did so, I watched him place the biggest dildo I've ever seen on his dashboard as he stared at me. This thing was bigger than his steering wheel and thicker than a can of beans. Now the thoughts started to race. Was this a warning? Was I interrupting his private time? I looked in the passenger seat 
in hopes of not seeing a potential victim to this huge thing. I told myself, okay, this sick weirdo is here just to pleasure himself. Time to leave. As I was leaving, I pulled up my map, trying to figure out the best and quickest way out of this bad decision. I was still watching the truck in my rearview mirror as well. I started to call my husband to tell him this insane story when I noticed he was starting to follow behind me. I was going at a snail's pace, fumbling with my Google map trying to make a decision, left or right. I came in from the right, but the map said the left is quicker. I noticed he was getting incredibly close, so out I went back where I came. My husband did not pick up. I called 911 because all I could think of was the worst scenario. What if he shoots out my tire? Now I was frustrated. What does he think he is, I thought. I told dispatch whatever was going on, dildo and all, and she told me, well, why don't you just leave? I let her know I was leaving. The speed limit was only 25 and I couldn't go that fast around the sharp, blind corners. I asked dispatch if they were going to send someone out because of this behavior and they told me no, just to leave. They didn't think he was actually following me. Now I was furious. I was trying to hold back crying because I was so mad at the situation and no one was coming to help. I finally hit a straightaway and I proceeded to floor it, reaching 60 miles per hour in this 25 zone. Surely, I thought, he isn't really going to follow me out. I watched him pick up speed and close the gap. I had to slow down on this blind corner, otherwise I'd flip it. He was literally on my bumper as I approached the corner. I take it at max speed and gun it down the next straightaway. Still on the phone with 911, as she nonchalantly tells me, well, just drive to the police station if he's actually following you. I yell, are you serious? Now where is the police station? Let me just fumble with my maps while I'm trying to get away from this creep. I finally get back to the entrance into civilization and busy traffic. Surely he will back off. I took several turns on my way to the police station while 911 dispatch told me each street to turn. She asked, is he still behind you, ma'am? I was outraged at this point. Yes, he is, I said. I was really trying not to be rude, but at this point, I was mad for the fact I had to leave the park instead of this cringy creep. Thankfully, my pup was still chilling at my side. I got to the street at the police station, and dispatch told me to slowly pull past the police officer that was waiting in park so I couldn't believe he was still on my tail. As I saw the police waiting, I pulled in and he pulled out and turned his lights on. As if it wasn't a wreck by now, the creepy guy again death stared me while he was getting pulled over, just outside of where I was trying to park. I headed to the station and met with another officer as he was listening to the traffic stop over the radio. The officer told me, of course, there isn't a law about owning a dildo or following someone, but doing both is questionable behavior. Now there's an open case against this creep. So if we cross paths again, creep, I have a couple of surprises for you. My German Shepherd has all her adult teeth, and we've been preparing for this moment. I hope you can run faster than her. This story goes back to 1998 when I was 16 years old. I was with two friends. It was a late summer evening on a Saturday and I was sitting in my room listening to some 80s rock, as teenagers back then would do. I got bored after some time and went outside to meet Ben and Jake. We were chilling in Ben's garage for a while, drinking beer and smoking some pot. We got bored pretty quickly and went out to do some teenage shit. I remember we were walking down this narrow path by the woods and down towards a lake. Back in the late 90s, there was a popular hangout spot for teenagers there 
so we hoped we might see some other kids there. When we arrived though, there was no one, and nothing except the sound of crickets out in the tall grass. We sat down for a while on an old bench, and just talked for about 15 minutes before Jake decided he wanted to go to an old fishing hut by the lake. We all enthusiastically go inside and explore it. It didn't take long after entering the hut for Jake and Ben to start breaking shit. But as they were walking around doing so, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. We went upstairs and found an old wooden boat lying on one of the floors, with a fishing net over it. As we were checking it out, we suddenly heard the wooden door to the hut creak open. The sound of heavy footsteps entering below followed by heavy breathing emanating up the stairs. We all stopped dead in our tracks and almost held our breaths in what I'm sure was a mixture of fear and trying to be quiet. There was around a five second break that seemed to stretch out much longer than before. Suddenly, a man spoke in a drunken voice. I know you're here. Come out, come out wherever you are you little brats. We could hear the heavy footsteps and the give of the old floorboards as the man made his way to the foot of the stairs. Quick thinking, Jake went inside the wooden boat and the rest of us followed. We put the fishing net over our heads and didn't move. The man arrived upstairs and we could hear him stumbling around. I can hear you. We were sitting dead still but I could feel the fear in all of us. The man was walking around and moving stuff. I was trying to think of a plan to escape without being caught, but we literally were like sitting ducks. Suddenly, I tug on the net and it grazed my hair as he ripped the fishing net off. Here you are. Jake reacted the fastest and pushed him away. The man fell onto his back. We all ran like hell out of there and threw the tall grass into the woods. We could hear the man give chase, but quickly he gave up, probably due to his drunken state. We all went back to Ben's garage and fell onto the couch out of exhaustion, the aftermath of the sprint, but also the adrenaline receding. When he had caught his breath, Jake then told us that the man dropped a knife when he fell to the floor. We all just sat in shock for a long time, to this day, I can't help myself but wonder what would have happened if Jake didn't push the man. Okay, this happened years ago, but it still has an effect on me, and in a way, I'm glad it does. It keeps me constantly noticing my surroundings. I was downtown. I had just visited my boyfriend, at the time, in jail. We had a good visit, he was getting out soon, so I was in a good mood. I had stopped in a store to buy some items, I don't really remember what. But after I paid for my stuff, I walked out going toward the bus stop to go home. Before I made it to the bus stop, this young guy stopped me and started asking me for directions. He smiled and apologized for scaring me. He then told me he was a college student and showed me his ID around his neck. I glanced at it. He started to explain he wasn't from Houston and he needed directions to a certain street in the area. I said I could show him. Again, I was in a good mood. Ordinarily, I don't do stuff like this, but he did look safe. Or so I thought. We started walking toward the edge of town, but the farther we got, the less people were around. This is when I started to hear that little voice in my head, telling me to turn around and go back. I started pointing toward the direction of the street he claimed he needed to go. As I was doing this, I started backing up, and he noticed this. I turned to walk off when he called out to me. I turned around. And when I did this, his face looked like pure evil. A monster. Let me stop here. I forgot to mention I wear glasses. My sight is so bad, 
I know without my glasses I'm legally blind. And now back to the story. He grabbed my glasses off of my face. It happened so fast. I started screaming and running down the street. I knew I was about to be killed. I was trying to stop traffic, but this part of downtown is less traffic and people. He started chasing me, and just when I thought this is it for me, I heard a lady's voice calling out to me to come in. It was a men's clothing store, and the voice was that of an older salesperson. They all took me in, asking if I was okay. Of course by then I'm crying and hysterical, because now I can't see. Only fuzzy images. Back then there were no cell phones. They asked me if I wanted them to call someone for me. I asked them to call my dad. He came to pick me up. My church, where I still belong, got together and brought me another pair of glasses. When I was able to bring myself to go back downtown, I had my dad take me back to that clothing store. I went in and thanked everyone there, especially the lady salesperson who saw what was going on, and stepped up to help me. Without her, I don't know if I would be here today. My advice to anyone, Pay attention to your surroundings, and for the asshole who tried to take advantage of me, I'm not that trusting person anymore. I sincerely hope you're dead, you piece of shit. So, for a bit of background, I'm a female from the UK, and I live near the coast. The part of the city I live in is quiet and friendly, and almost nothing ever happens. I live on a main road that runs from the city center to the beach. On the night I'm going to tell you about, this road was shut for road repairs, which was unusual as it's the main road in my city. This is a really important part of the story as I'm pretty sure if the road was open, this would have never happened. It's been six years, but this incident still haunts me to this day. I know that's such a cliche thing to say, but I'm still filled with regret and guilt, as well as pure fear that kept me up for weeks, if not years afterwards. I remember being bored on a January night, and decided to go meet one of my best friends at the time which we did most nights. However, it was late, at around 10 or 11 p.m., so I knew my mom wouldn't let me go out. Naturally, I did what any 14-year-old might do and snuck out. At that age, you really do believe you're invincible. I left my phone on 2%. Yeah, I know. Dumb move. Anyway, Anne messaged me telling me to meet her near the main road that runs to the coast, as we both lived on either side. The path I normally took was thin, and one side was lined with trees. On the other, the main road, where I would be visible to passing cars. This always made me feel safe. However, this night the road was closed, and so there wasn't anyone around. Because I had to walk down this dark path alone, I asked Anne if she would meet me halfway, which she did. We started our usual walk to find some pizza and gossip about high school life, feeling the rush of sneaking out and just being teenage girls. We walked past this one house, which was well known in my area. This house used to scare me as it sticks out compared to the other ones that surround it. It's an old rusty building on the end of the dark path and has graffiti all over the wall. The strangest thing about this house is that it has no windows. It was well known with my school as people used to throw rocks at the walls and claimed a murderer lived there, which I always believed was a lie. Anne made some joke about how the girl who was murdered there went to her mom's old school or something, but I paid no attention as I was already creeped out by the quietness of the sleeping city. As my friend and I approached the end of the dark path, a white bald man with a stained vest and tattoos suddenly appeared, blocking our exit. 
I remember he was so close to us, like he had known when we were coming, so he could block our way when we came close enough for him to reach out and grab us. He was a chubby looking tall man who was visibly dirty, but looking back now, he was probably only around 5 foot 6 or 5 foot 7. To us 14 year old girls of our size, anyone was tall in comparison. We both looked at each other as the creepy man stumbled toward us, even closer than he already was, and started speaking some nonsense. I can't remember exactly what he had said, but I remember him clearly saying, Are you two beautiful young girls, sisters? No, I'm white with blonde hair, and my friend is black, so clearly this man knew we weren't sisters. I have been raised to always be polite, and I'm also a very shy girl, so I giggled awkwardly and said no. Anne, on the other hand, flashed me a look like, why the fuck did you just reply to this creep? She took my hand and said, come on, let's leave. Although I was really freaked out, I just chalked it up to some drunk man with nothing better to do than scare young girls. As is often the way, until it does, I never thought anything bad could ever happen to me. However, to escape this situation, we either had to walk back down the dark path in the other direction, or we had to make our way past this creeper. Obviously, we decided the first option was the best. I wish this story ended here, but it's only just beginning. As I'm sure you already all guessed, the man started following us down the path. He was close behind us, like too close, and he was saying really creepy stuff like, You two are so small. It's not safe for you out here. You smell good. Let me take you home, girls. All in this mumbled, drunk voice. This really started ringing alarm bells, and I could feel myself starting to panic. Man whispered to me and said, Hold my hand, and when we get to the end, turn the corner and run. And that's exactly what we did. We ran so fast, faster than I've ever ran in my whole life. And I swear I didn't look back but I thought I could hear feet pounding on the ground behind us. I need to provide some context on how this main road is set out. It's huge, similar to a motorway, and on one side are houses, and on the other is a path, trees, and this creepy graffiti house. This is the path we just been followed down. There are only two ways to get across the road. The bridge on top, which is the way I came to meet Anne or the underpass that runs beneath the road. We couldn't take the bridge as that meant going back the way we came and potentially bumping into this creepster. So Anne and I were running, and when we finally stopped to breathe, we were both laughing and crying, not really taking it seriously, but also scared at the same time. Anne decided we really should go home. However, whilst she lived on the other side of the road we were currently on, but in order for me to get home, I had to take the underpass under the road and then walk a short distance back to my house. Anne decided she would walk me through the walkway under the road, and then when I was safe, she would run home from there. I agreed as I was really scared, and my phone was dead at this point. So, Anne walked me through, and we decided to sit on the bus stop seat while we calmed down. The bus stop was directly opposite the walkway where we met Mr. Creepy, but the road was empty, so we could see straight across to the path where we'd been chased along. We were both still confused about how to react to the situation at this point, and Anne even suggested we call the police, but we decided that meant our parents would find out we snuck out, and for our 14-year-old selves, the idea of our parents finding out was even scarier than the man that had just chased us. Stupid, I know. As we sat there, deciding if we should ring the police or our parents, we saw the exact same man come out from the underpass. The exact same one we'd walked through five minutes before. This means that this man must have been either following us the whole time, which we decided was unlikely as he seemed drunk, 
and wouldn't have been able to keep up with us, or he'd been watching us from the other side of the road this whole time. At this point we were in tears and turned to start running, only when we turned back around, the man was completely gone. At this point, my friend suggests that she's going to get the fuck out of there and go home, leaving me to walk alone. I said I would wait for her to go into the underpass, and once she was through, I'd run home too. I watched her disappear into the underpass and turned to leave, only to face the single most horrifying thing of my entire life. The creepy man from before was stood right in front of me, breathing heavily in my face. His arms reached out as he grabbed me, and I remember thinking, I am not letting this man get me. I remember screaming and kicking so loud that I wasn't even sure if any noise was coming out of my mouth. Tears were running down my face into my mouth as I screamed louder for someone to come save me from this man's grip. After what felt like hours of screaming bloody murder, I saw a Domino's delivery boy running up to me, and as fast as it started, it had ended. The man had let me go and was nowhere to be seen. The delivery boy was around 16 and didn't seem to be worried at all, even though I was in floods of tears and still screaming. It didn't bother me that he didn't care, as he had just saved my life, and I didn't want him to call the police as at the time I believed my parents would kill me. Please, if anyone is listening to this and finds themselves in a similar situation, just call the police, because what happened next still haunts me to this day. This is where it gets really scary, and I want to put a trigger warning here. I'm going to mention sexual assault, so please skip on if you wish. After I'd run home and got back safe, I turned my phone on and called Anne. Thank the angels watching us that night, because we were both safe and both swore to never tell anyone. Still to this day, six years later, this is the first time I'm retelling this horrible night to spread awareness of predators like this that are out there. When Anne's mom picked us up the next morning for school, the words that left her mouth have haunted me to this day. Girls. Be careful around the main road and the underpasses, as last night, there was a man who beat up and assaulted two young girls in the underpass. My blood ran cold, and Anne and I both looked at each other in horror. We had an assembly at the school the same day, where they showed the picture of the man. And sure enough, it was the same man who grabbed me and chased us that night. The police put out a statement along with an image of the man who'd been arrested, but also a picture of his house was leaked on Facebook, and I'm sure you've already guessed it. It was the creepy, no-window graffiti house at the end of the path. Whether this was his house or not, it still terrifies me, as it's the exact house he emerged near when he blocked our path. I'm almost 20 now. And when I come home and walk past that house, it makes me physically sick. And I'm sure to always keep my younger sister and tell her this to remind her never to sneak out. I lost touch with that. I know she's well as I see her posts on Instagram. But I can speak for both of us when I say we feel so guilty for not calling the police. As we could have saved those two girls. Who could so easily have been us. To the man who ruined those girls' lives. To the man who chased us and grabbed me. To the man who has not been charged with sexual assault. I hope you get the same pain that you inflicted on other people. I hope you rot. And for me, God please know I've learned my lesson. And I'll continue to do my bit to help young girls stay safe. I'm sorry the world treats us this way. I'm sorry we can't go out at night without being scared for our lives. May we work together to strive for change and put predatory men and women in jail where they belong.
So this was about three years ago, and it still creeps me out. I was 18 at the time. I was walking home from work at a local pizza joint and took my usual route home. It was about 9.45 to 10.15 p.m., and it was really dark out. As I'm getting about a hundred yards away from the street I live on, a white van turns onto that street. Something didn't sit right with me, so I yanked out my earbuds and paused my music. I then turned down my street, and as I'm getting closer to my house, I started getting a weird gut feeling. I look up from my phone as I was about to text my roommate, who was out of town at the time, that I was almost home. As I look up, I notice the white van sitting in front of my house, and the man inside is just staring at me. The yellow car light shining on his face. He had brown hair, glasses, and facial hair. His van lights were off, but his car was running. I stop and put my back to a tree in my neighbor's yard, and I just stood there, maintaining eye contact with this man. After about what seemed like an eternity, he starts driving towards the stop sign at the end of the road. I didn't put my back to him. I kept my back to the tree and maintained visual on the van the entire time until it stopped at the stop sign. He just sat there for about two to three minutes, all while I'm not looking away and while my back was still on the tree. Finally, he turned right the direction in which I had come from, and after about 20 seconds of making sure he or anybody else wasn't coming, I bolted to my house. I quickly get inside and lock the door. I go to the window and very quietly look through the blinds. After a few seconds of looking, he drives back up and down the street and left again. Afterwards, I texted my roommate what happened. I then went to each and every one of the windows in my house to make sure they were locked, along with the back door and the garage door. I made sure to keep all the lights off for the remainder of the night. I didn't sleep a lick that night. I was so paranoid at every sound or movement. Let's just say I never walked home after that. So I live in a small town where everyone leaves their cars unlocked and their front doors open. We pretty much know everyone, or at least know of everyone. My graduating class was 69. There's a small grocery store at Tops in the town, and I went to get ice cream and cold drinks from my mom since I was home from college. I get what I need and check out saying hi to the cashier, whom I went to high school with. As I'm walking out, an older gentleman is behind me. He looked a bit dirty, and maybe he'd been working on farm equipment or in the fields. It wasn't uncommon, so I smile and wave at him before I leave. Now most of the time this is where the story ends in my town. You say hi and leave, and that's how it seemed to be until I got halfway to my car. I'm walking and taking my time, and the man speed walks past me and almost bumps into my shoulder. He's also making these clicking sounds that he wasn't making in the store, but I dismissed this, thinking he must be in a hurry. So I get to my car and make my way out of the parking lot. That's when I realized he's following me, or at least it seemed like it. So I start heading home and he's still behind me. I live on a road that's kind of in a D shape, so instead of making a turn onto the straight, I went around the bend and then turned down the straight. This is a major out of the way way to get to my house, so now I know he's following me. I drive past my house and see some cops with someone pulled over on the main road. I pull behind the cop and wait. The truck drives past me. I wait just a minute longer and catch my breath. The cop eventually comes to my window and I explained it all. They told me they would keep an eye out for the white Ford F-150 for me. I hope I never see that old man again. I got out of work at 6.30pm and went to McDonald's to get an iced coffee. 
I pull up to the drive-thru and there's a red truck in front of me with a cap on the back. It's really wide so I can't see their mirrors and thus can't get a glimpse of who's inside. I'm minding my own business, listening to unsolved mysteries on YouTube when I see that the red truck has pulled up to the second pickup window. I didn't think anything of it and just assumed they had a big order and that the McDonald's employee asked them to pull up so I could get my iced coffee. I look up to see the truck's reverse lights come on. Okay, they must have pulled up a little too far and are backing up a bit. No big deal. They keep backing up without signaling to me at all that they're backing up. I slowly back up too. Luckily, no one is behind me. They keep backing up and backing up until they are finally parked at the first pickup window now. The McDonald's employee looks out the window at me, shrugs, and gives me a look like. I don't know why they just did that. A few minutes go by. At this point, I'm just thinking about how strange and not part of common etiquette it was to back up without signaling to anyone you need to do so. They could have easily hit me had I not been looking straight ahead, curious as to what they were doing. Now five minutes goes by. No one is being given any food. I just wanted my iced coffee, so I'm kind of annoyed that they backed up, thinking maybe they were told to go to the second window, since I only needed the coffee. But they suddenly felt like refusing to do so, so would get McDonald's to get them their food faster, and thus they backed up to the first pickup window. I don't know. Anyways, I continue to sit there and wait for my food when I see the passenger door to the truck open. Out comes an older man. He was wearing light khaki colored overalls and a dirty white t-shirt. He starts walking slowly over to my car. I'm thinking, maybe he's going to apologize to me for not signaling that they needed to back up. He gets to my passenger door window, turns so he's facing the window head on, and just stares at me. I'm waiting for him to signal to put my window down thinking he had something to say. He doesn't do anything. He just stands there and stares. He starts to lift his hand towards the door handle. I quickly lock the door. He scowls and walks back to the truck and gets into the passenger side. They immediately drive away the second he closes his door. They didn't get any food. They didn't get anything. They just left. I pull up to the drive through to finally get my iced coffee, and I head home. I have so many more questions than answers. Why did they back up without signaling? Why did they need to back up at all? Why did he get out of his truck? Why was he about to open my door? Why didn't he say anything? Why didn't they get their food or drinks? It might not be the creepiest thing to happen, but the whole ordeal made me so anxious that I was shaking the whole ride home. I just wish I had some insight or understanding to exactly what happened here. I went out to eat with a couple of friends, one of whom was up from out of state to visit. We turned off the highway onto an exit, and right around the corner, just out of sight, after the turn, a white car is parked mostly in the road, with an open door. No hazards on. The guy is just sitting there in the car. I got a horrible feeling, instant realization that it was intentional and not a problem with his car, and I yelled at her to reverse immediately. The guy gets out of the car, fists clenched, eyes bugged out of his head, stumbling, and taking very strange, jerky steps toward us. She froze and started shaking. I had to scream at her to reverse, even though cars are piling up behind us. I told her to let the cars go in front of us, keep backing up slowly, and he ignores the other vehicles. He's still staring at the two girls in the front seat. He's just beelining right for us. We manage to pull up as the other vehicles are also trying to figure out what the fuck is going on, and he seemed to get confused by the amount of cars passing him now. He turns around and starts heading back to his vehicle. I'm positive it was to grab some sort of weapon or gun. 
We manage to squeeze around and accelerate past him, and my friend starts to sob. I'm very certain that he was on heavy drugs and alcohol, and maybe he had a psychotic breakdown from the look of him. He wasn't asking for help. He wasn't trying to rob anyone. This guy blocked traffic on a highway with the intention of probably murdering the first person he was able to block. I still get adrenaline rushing every now and then thinking about it. I was 14 at the time, and I had stopped the night over at a friend's. It was around 8am, and we decided to go out and buy cookie mix, but since I left all my clothes at home, I had to borrow my friend's fairly short summer dress. Since it was quite bitter outside, I wrapped my face around with a scarf, put on as many socks as I could find, and headed out. We only had around two pounds to spend, so we were in the shops rummaging around for quite a while. That was until this nice older man asked us if he'd like the rest of his change. And being the children we were, we obviously said yes and gladly took his money. But we couldn't find the mix we were looking for, so we decided to go to a shop that was more uphill. We crossed the road and started making our way up the hill when this small blue car pulled up. It was the old man. He reached his hand out of the window and said that he had found some more cash in his car. I remember thinking to myself, wow, what a generous old man. So I took the money, thanked him, and continued walking up the hill. When we were around a quarter of the way up, I saw the same blue car turn the bend and pull up in front of us. It was the same man. He reached out his hand and said, oops, I forgot about these, as he handed me a bunch of loose change. I started to panic a bit. But regardless, I took the money, more or less to be polite, and he drove off around the bend. I told my friends I was beginning to get a bit suspicious of the guy, but since they were around a year younger than me, and both had autism, I don't really think they understood the severity of the situation. We carried on walking, although this time, I made sure that we walked a bit faster. Not even a minute later, the blue car pulled around the bend, and parked in front of us once again. This time, he said, Oh, I found you a fiver. He yet again reached his arm out and waited for me to take it. I started to go into panic mode. I genuinely felt as though I and or my friends were about to get hurt. I had to think fast, so I pulled down my scarf so I could talk to him better and said, Thank you very much, sir and very, very quickly took his money. As I pulled my scarf back up, he mumbled to himself, so that's what you look like, which was very quickly followed by a, oh no, it's fine, really, and in a somewhat skittish or, I guess, embarrassed manner, he rolled his window back up and quickly drove off. I never saw him again after that. I know it's probably not the creepiest story, but it was pretty scary for a 14 year old. When I was in middle school, I took the city bus to school because my parents couldn't drive me and no school buses routed to my neighborhood. I didn't live in a particularly good place but I never felt unsafe. That morning, I got on the bus to go to school. I was in sixth grade at that time, so I was about 12. But let me tell you, I have always looked much younger than my age. It was decently crowded, so I go to my usual spot in the back. A few stops go by, and then a man gets on and sits right next to me. It's been about 10 years now, but I still remember how he looked. Tall, thin, with long, straight, black hair. There was maybe one or two seats open, so it wasn't weird that he was next to me at first. I just figured he sat in the first seat he saw open. Then he started to talk to me. I can't remember what he said at first, but being early in the morning 
and already peeved that I had to share my space with him, I just made vague, disinterested noises at him. Then he asked me where I was going. That's when my spidey senses started to tingle, because obviously it is early morning and I'm a child, so I'm going to school. So I said, school, in a, a duh kind of way. I realize now he was probably looking for me to tell him which school. A few stops went by and the bus opened up more, so I quickly went and found another empty seat. Not five minutes later, he follows and sits right next to me again and still tries to get me to talk to him. He asks my name. I looked at the front of the bus and see some 8th graders that I know from school and riding this bus. My animal brain screams at me to find safety in the pack. I move up to the front of the bus and plant myself in the middle of them and basically press myself into them and give them the help me eyes. The guy moves in and sits directly in front of me. He asks my name and one of the boys I'm sitting with, G, quickly calls me by a fake name and turns his body so he's kind of shielding me. He carries on conversation with me until we get to our school. The group of 8th graders basically formed a circle around me and we huddled off the bus. I turned to make sure the creep didn't follow us. Thankfully he didn't follow, but for the next few weeks I caught either the earlier or later bus in case he was on it again. And since the bus stop was right in front of my school, I was afraid he knew where I went and would show up but I never saw him again. There's a lot of posts about young girls or even young boys walking innocently along, minding their own business, and some creep decides to follow or catcall them, or even try to get them in their vehicles. I'm glad I was with my poor son when this happened. My son is autistic. When he was six, he did not speak. Now, at eleven, you can't get him to shut up, though it is mostly about Pokemon. But we'd go to a friend's apartment during the day in the summer, where my friend and I would hang out while my son played on their computer. We'd leave before my husband got home so I could start dinner. As always, I walked to the car, not seeing anyone on the way there. With my kid and me, I'm very observant but not that day, I guess. I unlocked the car and strapped him in, and I'm about to close the door when I hear a voice next to me. Hey, girly, are you the boss? I turn to see a man, probably in his mid-sixties, wearing some kind of Margaritaville shirt, jean shorts, his white hair pulled back and wearing sandals. You sure got a pretty girl. Are you the boss, pretty girl? No. My son was and is very important. He's got model features and long, thick blonde hair with long eyelashes. I call him my fairy child, but he doesn't wear girly clothing. He's mistaken for a girl all the time. Always has been. He's been approached by men several times, calling him a pretty girl and a sweet girl and a gorgeous girl, but always in the store, never when we're both alone. I put my whole body between them and say, he's a boy. The man recoiled so hard, I'm surprised that he didn't dislocate a shoulder. That's a boy. Yeah, get the fuck away from my son, you creep. I watched him walk until he was out of sight, mumbling to himself. I was not moving from my spot until he was gone. Once he was, I quickly got into my car and left the apartment complex. I texted a friend when I was home and she said from now on, she'd be walking me to my car. I never saw that man again. My son is now 11, and people still call him Miss and Pretty Girl, despite the monster truck shirts we put on him. So last summer, I booked a glamping trip in the next county over, the website looked beautiful, a campsite of six large yurts outside of a lovely village. Coincidentally, I had driven through that village before, 
as it's close to a really nice historic castle I like to visit occasionally. So we pay our money, and my husband, two kids, and I pitch up. It's one of the last weekends of the summer, and it was lovely weather. The campsite was on a small hill, and the people who owned it lived on top of the hill in their farmhouse. We were checking in on a Sunday night for two nights, as we were shift workers at the time. We passed other people checking out, and they all looked happy. The owners of the site showed us down to our yurt and mentioned that we were the only ones on the site for our stay at this time. We were happy with that to be honest, because with two young kids, it meant they could make noise if they wanted to and we wouldn't disturb anybody. When she showed us around, she did say the yurt door didn't lock, but none of them did. Which okay, fine, because you don't lock a tent, right? The place was in its own mini wooded area and it was absolutely beautiful. The owner also mentioned the kids would be safe to wander as they had perimeter fences because of their dogs. The first night was fun. We had a barbecue, the kids played and then we went down to sleep at about 8. I found it hard to sleep but I often do somewhere new. There was only patchy phone coverage so we read until we fell asleep. The next morning my husband seems a bit out of sorts, but I asked him if he was alright, and he was all like, yeah, fine, so I left it. We went out for the day and had a great time. The whole day was blazing hot, and then we got back. I was washing up after dinner, and the kids were playing, and a shadow came over the whole place. I felt eyes on me, and it went pretty cold. Honestly, it felt like something bad was going to happen. I felt dread hit me. We'd already paid to stay, but I pulled my husband to one side and said, We have to leave this place right now. I don't know why. I've just got a bad feeling. Please, let's just go home. Normally he'd try and talk me out of something like this, but he didn't. He started getting the kids together and I packed our stuff. We went to the farmhouse where the couple who owned it sat outside playing with their dogs. My husband started loading up the car while I apologized to them. I explained we needed to leave because our youngest was feeling ill. They said how sorry they were about it, and then just as I turned to leave, the male owner asked if my husband had been outside the house last night at about 3 to 4 in the morning. I said no, he hadn't left my side all night. He asked if I was sure. By this point my husband was by my side, and he answered that no. He hadn't. Why? Well, says the guy, the security lights came on and the dogs started barking. And when we looked outside, there was a man wandering around, who then turned around and walked back down in the direction of the yurts. They assumed it was my husband. We both said it wasn't, and we said our goodbyes quickly. I tore out of that place in the car, and then about a quarter mile down the road, my husband turned to me and said, You're right. I was quiet this morning. I didn't say anything because I thought you'd take the piss. I wanted to use the bathroom in the wee hours, but as I was about to get up, I heard footsteps on the decking outside. It wasn't hooves or something on four legs. It was something on two legs. I laid there as quietly as possible and hoped the kids wouldn't wake up or something. The whole thing, still freaks me out. When I was 14, I was asked to babysit my three younger cousins. They were aged 8, 4, and 1. It was in an extremely rural mountainous part of Pennsylvania. My aunt and uncle had a wedding to go to over an hour away and would not be back until very late. Their house was situated on a steep mountainside. Their back deck had a 15-foot drop onto a rocky hill below, leading down to a river. Their closest neighbors were about a half a mile away. The closest main road was about a mile away. And that night, there were no lights to be seen anywhere around them. Basically, it was in the middle of nowhere, and you would have to know where you're going to get there. You don't just accidentally end up there. 
My aunt and uncle left us with some pizza and their cell phone number next to their landline, and then they headed out. The baby was already asleep. The four-year-old wasn't feeling well and was quietly watching TV in the living room as he dozed off, and the eight-year-old was playing Guitar Hero with me up in the loft. The loft overlooked the living room to the left, where I could keep an eye on the four-year-old, and there was a huge window that overlooked the driveway to the right. This description of the driveway is an important detail to the story. The road that led to their house ran straight into their forked driveway and was a dead end road. The house was as far as you could go. Go to the left of the driveway. There is a large open carport and that's where my aunt and uncle parked. The right driveway led down a very short but very steep hill to a large leveled out area and ended against the garage door that opened to the basement of the house. It was never used as the garage, but served as my uncle's man cave, and that's where he spent most of his time. Right beside the garage door was a normal door with a window, so you could see right in, but this driveway was exclusively used by the kids as a play area, because it was the only flat yard-like area on the property, and being on the mountainside, there isn't much room to safely play outside otherwise. No cars ever drove down there, ever. There are too many toys and bikes in the way, and friends and family knew this. It was about 10 p.m., pitch black outside. No moon to illuminate the area either. My cousin and I were still playing Guitar Hero when headlights caught the corner of my eye, and it wasn't my aunt's minivan headlights. Huge truck headlights with those roof lights you often see on jeeps or other off-road trucks. Not only that, the truck was going down the right driveway, the kids' play area. This was not my aunt and uncle. This was not anyone they knew. Panic and dread filled my body. I was a small teenage girl alone in an isolated house on a mountain at night with three children in my care. In a terrified voice, I asked my cousin, Who's that? Jake, do you know whose truck that is? And then he looked panicked. No, I've never seen that truck before, he replied. I quickly ushered him downstairs, still unsure what to do. But the two little ones were sleeping down there, and I wanted to make sure that they were safe. I checked on the baby and then grabbed the phone to call 911, and then I started to hear the metal garage door being shaken violently. No one ever opened that garage door. More panic fills me. I hear them try the door beside it, the metal doorknob jiggling. No one was actually knocking. It's not like they were checking to see if my uncle was down there, plus the lights were out. It was dark down there. They knew no one was down there. They were definitely breaking in. The door leading to the basement steps was right next to the phone, so I could clearly hear all this going on. I quickly turned the little lock on the doorknob, just in case they did make it into the basement. My heart was practically jumping out of my chest. I'm talking to the 911 dispatcher as my eight-year-old cousin clings to my arm. The operator is calm and trying to calm me, but I knew... It would be at least 30 minutes until a police officer could get up there, assuming they didn't get totally lost on the mountainside in the pitch dark. I just kept thinking, we're fucked, we're dead. This is how I die. The operator asked for the number my aunt and uncle left me, so she could have another dispatcher call them to let them know the situation. I turned around to grab the paper with the number on it, and to my absolute horror, I see a man peering in the large sliding glass door. A huge, burly, what had to have been six foot four man with long scraggly red hair and a big red bushy beard. And what made it worse, he was grinning at me. Grinning in a way that still scares me to this day. Meanwhile, I had to have looked like a terrified deer in the headlights. I was shaking so hard I could barely hold the phone. There was a second man behind him I couldn't see as clearly. I have no idea what he looked like, but he was equally as tall. But he was a bit more lanky than the larger man at the sliding glass door. I screamed, 
Oh god, they're here. And before the 911 operator can say anything, my eight-year-old cousin says, Mr. Jim? His voice was very confused. It wasn't like my cousin was happy or even relieved to see him. I asked, you know who that is. But before my cousin could answer, I turned my attention to the man at the door. I'm on the phone with the police, I shouted. I'm grateful he didn't try that door because I don't think it was locked. The man stared at me for a moment, eyebrows furrowed, kind of like he was deciding what he wanted to do next. But then he just backed away into the darkness. What seemed like an eternity later, I saw the truck lights back out of the driveway and then back down the road until they disappeared. I was still scared shitless, and so was my cousin. He'd only met the guy a few times, an acquaintance of his dad. It wasn't like he was a close family friend, and obviously, because again, he went down the wrong driveway. Visitors never go down that way. The 911 operator asked for a description of the man, and then told me they'd gotten in touch with my aunt and uncle, and they were on their way home. She stayed on the phone with me until a police officer showed up a bit later to make sure that the men were gone, and they stayed with us until my aunt and uncle got home so they could ask them some questions. My uncle was furious, not at me for calling them home early, but at this, Mr. Jim guy, he muttered something like, I'm gonna fuck him up. My aunt was mad at my uncle, and told him to tell Jim to never come back again. I didn't know this at the time, but my uncle had a drug problem. I don't know what Mr. Jim or his accomplice were doing, or what they would have done if I wasn't on the phone with the police, but that grin was not a friendly one. It was sinister. And again, he also had to have known my uncle was not there, because the basement was dark. He would have seen through the window at basement door. He had also tried lifting the garage door, something not even my uncle did. He intended to break into the basement. That much is clear to me. What other explanation is there? I never babysat for them again, and I don't think I even went back up there. Because not long after, my aunt divorced my uncle and moved out. This happened several years ago, and it has seriously made me rethink camping alone. I was with two friends at this time, and I worry about what would have happened if I was by myself. Two friends and myself were on a cross-country trip, and Roswell, New Mexico, was one of our stops. We were there for the catch, but we were also camping for most of the trip, so we got a site at Bottomless Lake State Park about 20 minutes outside of the city. We did our thing in town for the day and headed back to our campsite around sundown. Everything seemed pretty standard at first. There were some neighbors camping down the road and we could hear their music, the moldy peaches, a pretty light-hearted soundtrack which didn't set the creepiest of tones. My friends, who were a couple, read and wrote in their journals by lantern light and I drank a couple of beers while taking long exposure photographs of our campsite. The music died down. My friends got tired and went to sleep. And after I got the shot I wanted, I did too. I awoke fairly disoriented. Somewhere in that state of transition from light to deep sleep, I heard crunching around my tent. Not knowing if I was dreaming or not, I just kind of sat up in my tent to figure out if what I was hearing was real or just remnants of sleep. I started to hear it again, and this time it was closer. The sound wasn't just closer, it was directly outside of my tent. Understandably, the hair on the back of my neck was poker straight, and I knew something was up. It was a moment that I thought that it could have been a ranger. Who knows, maybe our registration was messed up, or maybe we left the headlights on on the car. I asked out, if someone is there, can you please make your presence known? Nothing. Hello? Please, 
identify yourself. Still nothing. I sat there, frozen with the most intense sense of fright I've ever felt, and it was dead silent. I calmed myself to lay back down, hoping I'd been imagining it, and I closed my eyes. From what I could tell, within the next five minutes, the footsteps started moving around my tent. I shot back up and knew someone was out there. At this moment, something so surreal happened that I can't quite adequately express my sense of fright. As I sat there, open-mouthed and silent, the end of my tent started to be lifted by the person outside. I screamed for my friends in their tent, screamed for them to wake up and that someone was outside. It felt really hectic. My friends were disoriented. I was disoriented. And from then on, I didn't hear or see anything else. My friend was basically yelling back at me to stick my head out of my tent and check it out. But I was absolutely terrified that if I did, I'd get my head lopped off or I'd have a gun stuck in my face. I finally worked up the balls and saw nothing. No one. We got out of the tents and into the car, and I told them everything. They seemed concerned, yet skeptical. I was adamant that something had happened. We decided to shine our headlamps from the car in the direction of our tents, which was kind of surrounded by these rocky hills and a dried up riverbed. As we scanned the rocks with our lights, Another light hits the rocks right behind our tents. We decided that it would probably be a good idea to leave our shit and get a motel room, so we headed to Roswell at about midnight. The whole night I felt kind of stupid. I was also really scared. I kept trying to tell myself that I was just dreaming, or that it was a raccoon, or that I'd just seen too many horror movies. We kind of joked about it watched cops on shitty motel TV and fell asleep. When we went back in the morning, my fears were unfortunately confirmed. We rolled up and nothing seemed to be out of place, nothing stolen or moved. We start picking up our things and I begin to take my tarp off. My friend says out loud, well that's really fucking weird, and signals me over. The elastic bungee cords that hold the rainfly on his tent were cut, clean through, like with scissors or a knife. The tent was brand new. I went back over to my tent to see if I had the same, and was immediately drawn to the fresh boot prints that circled my tent, footprints that were on top of mine. That said, we packed up, and we did it fast. We almost didn't even really talk about it. I actually even think that my friend who got his tent cut open is still a bit skeptical. I can't say for certain who this person was or what they were trying to do, but they certainly achieved scaring the living shit out of me. About four years ago, my wife and I planned an evening out for her birthday. My parents babysat and we went out to a restaurant. Because I drove, I didn't drink. So we didn't bother to go anywhere else after we were done in the restaurant. But because the night was still young, we decided to go on a long drive. A location which is relatively nearby is a large national park. We decided to take a drive up there and just sit and chat under the stars. When we arrived up there, the country roads were dead. I found a nice open parking area to pull the car up in. We sat inside the car, talking. We started making things up, and things carried on. Until we began having sex. At no point did either of us leave the car. As we were doing the deed, headlights lit up our vehicle. Instantly we thought, oh god, there's someone driving by. I hope they don't see what we're doing. For me, it was an instant turn off, so I quickly pulled up my trousers and ceased. I thought the car was just a fellow traveler passing by, but to our surprise, the car pulled into our area and began circling us. I put the keys in the ignition and said, let's go. 
I drove out of the parking area, onto the road, and back to the main connecting road. The car followed. Once on the main connecting road, we could see the make, model, and color of the car that was now following us. It was a dark red Ford. I drove quickly, but not recklessly. The car matched my speed and was right up my ass. At this point, neither of us were 100% sure if we were being paranoid or if this car was really meaning to follow us. So I said, I know what I'll do. I'll pull off at a random turning and see what they do. So I put my foot down, and after a few hundred yards down the main road, I made a late left turn down a really narrow side lane. I pulled up after a while on the side road, stopped, and turned my headlights off and watched in my rearview mirror to see if the red Ford carried straight on the main road or if he turned off. A few seconds later, there he was. He had turned off and was now coming down this narrow lane towards us again. At first we were blinded by his headlights, but I was sure it was him. My wife said, I don't think it's the same car, you know. It is. It is. Look, I replied. As he got closer, it became apparent it was the same car, so I drove down the road further and luckily I found a space big enough to turn my car around. I spun around and backed the main road again. He followed. Now back on the main road for a second time, I did now decide to speed. As I was heading towards the built-up city center, he kept behind me the whole way. Eventually, we stopped at a red light, and he was right behind us. I looked in my rear view and saw his face. To this day, I can still see his face. A middle-aged, slightly tubby man with glasses and thin gray hair. At this point, I was freaked out. We both were. I said to my wife, I'm going to keep driving and try to lose him, but I'm not driving home so he doesn't know where we live. She agreed. We drove around for maybe another ten minutes. He was still following. At this point, I was beginning to consider the possibility of calling the cops, but I thought I would give it a few more minutes of trying to lose him. Thankfully, a few streets later, he turned off and was never seen again. I know it's a real possibility that he may have been a dogger, but if he were a dogger, or if he thought we were doggers, then surely he would have understood we weren't interested when we were actively driving away. The fact he followed us into a built-up city for 25 minutes or more makes me think he had more sinister intentions. I don't know. What do you think? To this day, it's still the weirdest moment of my life. PSA. I'm not sure if this is a thing in America, but dogging is basically where strangers meet other strangers in the wilderness to have sex. A little background on the events I'm going to talk about. This all happened in mid-October. My family owns about 160 acres out in the middle of nowhere. The closest neighbor is a friend who we let rent the pasture for his cattle when he needs to. Some friends and I decided we wanted to build a little cabin out there that we could hang out at. So, one weekend, one of my friends and I loaded up a tractor we were renting from his dad and then headed out there. It was just me and him that weekend, as everyone else was busy. We got there a little late, since it took a while to get everything loaded and packed for the weekend. He sat about, setting up our tent, and I made our fire. As I did so, I made an odd discovery. There was a phone book from a few towns over, still in its plastic sleeve, right next to our fire pit. I picked it up and showed it to my friend. We both enjoyed scaring ourselves, and I made the comment that we aren't alone out here. We both laughed at it. Later that night, we're sitting around the campfire, just talking and bullshitting. There was a big bright moon that night, and a bit of breeze which made whatever leaves were on the ground rustle. It was a little creepy, but we enjoyed the atmosphere. We noticed, however, 
someone crossing through the middle of the field, their body just visible from the moonlight. At first, it was a little odd. My friend and I discussed for a few seconds if we should confront him, but I made the suggestion that he was probably just taking a shortcut across the field. Although I didn't really like it, it wasn't a huge deal. If we caught him doing it again, then we would confront him, we decided. The rest of the night passed pretty uneventfully. We eventually got in our tent and laid down. We were probably 20 or so feet from the fire pit, which was by that point burning quite low. We talked for a few minutes, and then we go silent, trying to fall asleep. As we're laying there, we hear something. It sounded like quiet footsteps walking around the fire pit. We both look at each other, silent. Then we hear a piece of wood get thrown in the fire, and it flamed up quite a bit. I grabbed the shotgun I always kept in the tent, and quickly racked it. We heard someone run away, but by the time we got out, they were too far away. The rest of the weekend was pretty quiet and the events of the first night seemed kind of dreamy to us. We just cleared out the area for the cabin and cut and stacked the trees we cut for firewood. Next weekend, we get out there. My uncle was out there as well, and we went to check his game cams. This is where it got much more worrying for us. My uncle told us how he was pissed because someone had stolen the batteries and SD cards out of the cameras. We told him about what happened the weekend before, and then parted ways. When we got out there, we noticed that quite a bit of our wood that we cut and stacked was already gone, and we were the last people to camp out there, which means someone had come out and had themselves a fire. We then went and checked on the tractor, which we had left down there. We found it was broken into, and the chainsaw which we left in the cabin had been stolen. To make a long story short, Nothing else so far has happened. I was hesitant for a few weeks to continue with the cabin. Since we weren't there all the time, I was worried it would be an incentive for whoever was there to stay. So I was on my way back home from the city center roughly at 9 to 10 p.m and I had a sandwich with me. I have to take this bus to get home with maybe 16 stops until it's mine, which is not a busy stop. It's usually only me, and sometimes one more person gets off there. I got on the bus at the back door, and the last minute I sat down, this drunk guy comes over to me and asks if I speak Hungarian. I say no, which is a lie, so I avoid further conversation. He then continues speaking in English and says could I give him some money for food. I say no, I haven't got any Hungarian currency on me right now. Again, that's a lie, but I just wanted to eat my damn sandwich. This guy then proceeds to signal me to give him a piece of my sandwich and almost breaks off a piece of it. So I say to him, sorry dude, no offense, but I just want to eat my sandwich. At first, he seemed pretty chill about it, but this is when it gets interesting. He sits back at his seat, three seats behind me, and I notice he's not alone. He's with two equally drunk gentlemen, but the bus now closes its doors and starts. As I'm eating my sandwich, I hear the guys talking shit about me in Hungarian, assuming I don't understand it. They were saying stuff like, Man. This dickhead won't give me a piece of his sandwich. What a prick. Man, I would so bash his head in with a glass. I'm so angry. I hear them agree on getting down at my bus stop so they can beat me up. I never had to deal with a situation like this, so I start to think. I come to the conclusion that my best option is to get down at my stop and run home. I can easily outrun three 30-year-old drunk guys. Meanwhile, because I'm focused on what to do, I don't touch my sandwich. This got them even angrier. Hey man, he didn't even finish his sandwich. I bet he gets home and throws it in the trash. And one of them said he murdered someone in his dream. 
The other one says he dreamt the same thing too, and that this is not a coincidence. I'm there thinking, surely they aren't barbaric assholes, but I was wrong. I hear them discussing my height, weight, and buffness, and then they agree they can take me easily, a three-on-one thing. At this point I'm sweating and thinking about other options, because my stop is coming up. We're heading into the suburbs. The bus is starting to get empty. Then I realized I can pretend that I get off somewhere and hope they get off. So I decide to do that. At the last relatively busy stop before my stop, I stood up and went to the front door where four of the people stood waiting to get off. The bus stops and I start to go towards the door, but then I stop when they can't see me. Surprise, surprise, they got off. The guy starts walking to the door calmly because there were other people at the stop. But when he got to the door, luckily the bus driver closed it. I checked if anyone else got off with me at my stop though. I think this could have gone so much worse. I was lucky to get the best case scenario. This happened when I was 18. I was technically the creep in the situation, even though I never meant any harm. Before I begin this story, I need to point out that I have a few minor mental disabilities, so sometimes I can't read a situation for what it is, until it's too late. God knows I've suffered for that multiple times in my life. Anyway, I used to work at a grocery store. It was rather large so I had quite a few co-workers I barely knew. One day I was working a rush when I saw a woman talking with one of my co-workers, Mike. They seemed to know each other rather well, and I could have sworn I recognized her from one of the departments, so I assumed she was a co-worker on maternity leave. The reason I say maternity leave is because she was holding a baby boy who looked like he was just a few weeks old. Anyway, the woman came to my register to ring up her groceries when she was done talking to Mike. I greeted the woman with a smile, and I asked her the typical questions like, How are you? Or, Do you want this in a bag? I looked again at the baby she was cradling. I've always been good at taking care of kids, and I've helped out at camps, daycares, and regular babysitting jobs countless times in the past. So I asked the typical questions about her baby as well, like, What's his name? How old is he? When I finished ringing her up, I told her to have a good day, and that was that. I later found out from Mike that she wasn't a co-worker at all, just a regular at the store. I figured that was okay. There were a lot of those, several of which I knew, and she seemed nice enough. I saw her shopping with her family quite often after that, and, like with every regular I knew, I always offered a smile and a wave when I saw them. One Saturday, I had just finished my shift, and I was walking out the door to my car when my mom called me and asked me to pick up some hot dogs. They were all the way at the back of the store, and I was at the front, but I rolled my eyes and began to walk back the way I had come. I cut through one of the aisles to get there faster, and I came across a group of four people taking up the entire aisle. I recognized them as the woman and her family, I didn't want to bother them, so I tried my best to walk around them, but they were going incredibly slowly, and no matter what direction I tried to go, I couldn't get around them. Looking back, I probably should have just turned around and walked through a different aisle, but I got to the hot dogs before that even crossed my mind. The family resumed walking, and I got the hot dogs, paid for them, and then left the store. I worked again the next day. And of course, the woman and her family came to the shop again. I smiled and waved like always and continued to work. About 20 minutes later, my manager asked if he could talk to me. I didn't think anything of it. I just thought he needed my help with cleaning the bathrooms or something. So I followed him to the back room. When we got there, my supervisor was there too. I was instantly confused and nervous. To make a long story short, they told me that a woman had reported me for stalking her and trying to hurt her baby. 
I still remember feeling like I'd just been slapped in the face as I knew instantly who they were talking about, even though I had never laid a hand on the woman or her baby. I explained my side of the situation, also making sure to mention the events of the day before when I was shopping. Luckily, I had known both my manager and the supervisor ever since I'd started working at the store, so they believed me and chalked it up to the woman simply misreading the situation. The rest of that day, I felt like I was going to throw up. I'd come close to losing my job and had been accused of being a criminal, and I was technically still a kid. Even though I'd been assured by my managers and later my parents that I'd done nothing wrong, I still spent a good few months after that, constantly fearing that someone else with a baby would think of me in that way. It got to the point where I couldn't even look at another child. I've since gotten over those feelings, but over the years I've learned to be more careful with what I say or do. Luckily, for the rest of the time that I worked in that store, I never saw that woman or her family again. So I met Tom through this app called Geeking. I won't lie, that place was a breeding ground for predators and just in general, awful human beings. And of course, 13 year old me was using the app daily. I started talking to him about his mental health issues and the classic dynamic of a young girl who just wants to help this older boy who she has a crush on, so then becomes his therapist begins. What I learned over the years of being his emotional support victim, Tom was two years older than me. He had an abusive upbringing with many mental health issues because of it that he struggled with. Our heavily toxic, verbally abusive relationship was on and off for over two years, until I put it to an end in the summer of 2019. After he threatened to sexually assault me, I blocked him on everything and moved on with my life. In the winter of 2019, I'm working in a cafe, still living in the deep country with my parents, hardly posting on social media, when I get a message. It's from an unknown Instagram account. I really wish I had screenshotted the first message, but it pretty much said, Hey, it's Tom. We haven't spoken in a while, but I'm going to a concert this weekend in a city close to you and I thought about you. I messaged back to be nice, just really replying with I'm doing well, but I ended it with, I would rather not stay friends. He says he's comfortable with this, and the conversation ends. It's two days after, I'm working my five hour shift in the cafe. I come in through the back door like I always do, and I see a pile of what I think are old clothes at the edge of the window. I don't think anything of it, I do my shift, then I grab my stuff and leave out the door. I walk down the street, still feeling completely safe, until I'm grabbed by my back, and this six foot two man, who I vaguely recognize, is smiling down at me. He says my name, and another huge wave of fear kicks in, as I immediately recognized his voice. It's Tom. I don't even give him the time of day to speak. I just shook him off and started power walking down the street towards the shop where I knew my dad was. I kind of think I should have ran straight back to my work, but as a 16 year old who had never been in a confrontational or terrifying situation before, I just ran straight to a parent. Tom follows me, shouting my name. I managed to lose him and reach my dad. After that, I got a message from the Instagram account saying that he was sorry, but he was in love with me and he needed to have me, which still to this day makes me sick to think about it. He also mentioned that he thought it was romantic that he traveled all this way. I blocked that account and he made a new one. I also contacted my work about it. That's where my boss checked the security cameras outside. My boss said that he'd been sitting there since 8am. I started work at 10am. He was the pile of clothes I saw. 
I blamed myself for a really long time and shrugged it off as not that big of a deal. However, the more he got in contact with me after, the more petrified I felt. I'm now in therapy. I have received messages from him saying that he's changed, he's sorry, that he's a Christian now, and the latest one is that he has a terminal illness and needs to see me one last time. Since changing my number and email, I've not heard from him. I've been told by others that going to the police might make me feel less safe, as they can't do anything now as it's over the internet. I'm back to feeling safe now, which is great. But to Tom, let's never meet again. When I was around 12 years old, I spent the afternoon at a friend's house who I knew from school. He lived in a neighborhood that I wasn't all familiar with, so when we decided to take our bikes for a ride, I simply followed him until we came to a large wooded area. It was in a valley that descended away from the roadside, and from what I could see, became rather dense and overgrown quite quickly. Because of all the foliage, we decided to leave our bikes and go down on foot. We'd been hiking for about 20 minutes when we realized we could no longer see the spot that we'd left our bikes at, and we were surrounded on all sides by thick vegetation. Being boys, we thought this was absolutely fantastic and decided to carry on further into the valley. At some point, we came across what looked like an abandoned campsite. There were some old cans laying around that looked like they'd been used to boil water, an old ashy fire pit, and quite a lot of plastic sheeting. We had a look around but didn't really find anything interesting, so we decided to carry on with our hike. Just as we were leaving, somebody called out to us from somewhere on the other side of the camp. A homeless man appeared, no doubt the camp dweller, and demanded to know what we were doing with his things. We explained that we didn't take anything, and we were just looking around, and he calmed down. We made polite conversation for a few minutes, exchanged names, and gave a vague idea of where we had come from. At this point, we didn't feel like we were in any danger, and the homeless guy was actually quite friendly. We decided to get going though, and said our goodbyes, but he told us that we had to give him something before we went. We hadn't brought any food or water with us, and so didn't have anything to offer him, and he apparently took exception to this. He started yelling at us and demanded our shoes, which neither of us were willing to part with. We started to back away from him, and at the same time try and figure out which way we had come from, when all of a sudden he pulled a knife out and started running towards us. I don't remember exactly which way we went or how far we had to run, as I was terrified and full of adrenaline. I looked back a few times and realized we were getting away from him, but he was still chasing us even though there was no cover from the trees at this point. We reached the side of the road where we had left our bikes, and fortunately had enough of a lead on him, so that we could hop on and pedal for all we were worth. A couple of builders who were offloading materials up the road saw that we were panicked, and stopped us to find out what was going on. We gave them a brief version of events, and they went back to see if he was still around, but apparently he was gone when they got there. My friend told his folks what happened that day, but I never heard anything more about it. As far as I know, he could still be living at his campsite, but I certainly was not going to go back and check. I went to the grocery store today. I entered the first set of doors into the cart area. I then grabbed a cart and paused for a man to enter the second set of doors from the lobby to the store. He had no cart and I figured would be moving faster than me. He took a step back insisting, ladies first. I smiled, thanked him and went on my way. 
While comparing two items in the store, I noticed someone approaching in my peripheral vision, and when I looked up, it was the same man. He stayed several feet away and said, I hope this isn't too forward, but you're very cute. You smiled at the front door and it was just so cute. I blushed, smiled and said, yeah, that's forward, but thanks. He stared at me for a few moments like he expected more, so I smiled, nodded to signify good day sir, and then turned back to my shopping. He walked away, and I thought that maybe he was just an awkward person, not malicious. I finished shopping, bought my items, and left the store. As I was getting close to my car, I noticed the same man leaning against the cart corral near my parking space. I froze when I saw him, and then he said, May I approach? Have you been waiting here just for me? I asked. He smiled. Yes. May I approach? He asked again. To be honest, I'm weirded out that you even know where I parked and that you waited near my car outside. I would rather you did not approach me. Okay, that's why I asked. Sorry for anything I did to make you feel weird. I watched him get into the driver's side of a car nearby before unlocking my trunk to unload my groceries. The only way he would have known where I parked is if he had followed me in the store from the parking lot. Knowing that made both encounters in the store seem fabricated and freaky. It was the most polite creepy encounter I've ever had, but it was still really creepy nonetheless. I went to a gas station to check my wheels and undercarriage for any tracking devices. I didn't find anything, but I am glad I live with two protective, 65 pound plus dogs, just in case. This happened a couple of years ago. My brother and I went for a hike to stave off cabin fever from self-isolating. We chose a pretty remote trail to lower the risk of coming into contact with other people. I was walking ahead of my brother, and the gravel on the track was making our footsteps sound really loud. I was listening to the rhythm of his footsteps behind me. About 20 minutes in, I started hearing other footsteps starting off faint and getting louder, until they were the same pitch as my brother's, but they were much faster like a running rhythm. They suddenly came to a halt, and I could hear the motion of someone stopping on gravel. That sudden, sharp, rocky sound, if you can imagine it. I assumed there must be someone running or jogging on the track, and sure enough, I saw a shadow to the side of me appear, which looked like a person's head next to mine, as though they were right behind me. I stopped and turned around to let them pass, because the track was narrow. However, when I turned around, it was just my brother staring back at me. He was confused as to why I'd stopped, so I was asking if he was running a second ago, and he said no. I asked if there had been anyone behind him, and he said not that he was aware of. I thought it was strange, but I let it go and carried on. About five minutes later, we came around a corner, and there was this smell of just pure death, like a really strong off-meat smell. We figured it was a dead animal and kept going. We reached the hike lookout about 20 minutes later, chilled out for a bit, and then headed back. We passed the death smell, and then around the exact same spot where it had happened before, I started hearing the running again. I ignored it this time because it was starting to freak me out and we picked up the pace to get back to the car. I told my mom, and she joked that the smell must have been a dead jogger, and I was being haunted by them, to which I laughed at at the time, but now I'm wondering, what if it was? Maybe I should have investigated the smell.
This happened in my hometown when I was seven. For a bit of context, I lived on an island off the coast of Washington State, in a military town that's among one of the safest places to live in all of the US. But weirdos are everywhere. Timing is vague for me, but since I was outside playing with my friends, it was likely summer evening just before dinner time. We were screwing around riding our bikes in the street, running around, the usual kid stuff. When a car pulled up and stopped in the middle of the street, I don't remember exactly what the man driving it said, but he must have beckoned me over there because I know I walked close enough to hear. He asked me if I'd seen any other kids wandering around because his were missing. I noticed then that there was also a woman in the car with him, so I assumed she was the mom and he was the dad. I said no, that I hadn't seen any kids wandering around, but that there was a park nearby around the corner and he might be able to find them there. The man then asked if I would be willing to get in his car and show them where the park is. Although I didn't understand just how dangerous this was, I was well aware of the whole stranger danger thing, so I said no. He asked again if I would please get in the car with him and help him find his children at the park. I said no, sorry, I can't do that, but I did give him directions to the park and then I skipped off to continue playing with my friends who were standing there, watching the whole time. The man drove away. A few minutes later, my mom came outside to call me in for dinner, and I bounced happily up the driveway to tell her how I'd helped someone. I then explained the whole thing to her. Her face changed a bit, but she just nervously said, That's very nice of you, hon, and I felt a surge of pride. And then my dad came home, and my mom obviously told him what had happened. His reaction was much different. He told me that although he was proud that I liked to help people, that I was never, ever to approach anyone I didn't know like that again. He said, Remember, adults should never be asking children for help like that. He told me I was lucky I hadn't gotten snatched, and to always remember it because they would have lost me forever if things had gone badly. He was very stern, which hurt my little ego, and I lost a tiny bit of my innocence that day. Now that I've had 13 years of knowing my dad, he was only stern because that's his reaction when he gets scared. The poor guy. Before that, I had escaped as a toddler. I was found on a cliff in Japan, and then I left the yard another time in San Antonio to sell my coloring book pages door to door. I'm sure he was wondering what fresh hell he was in with a child like me. So to wrap up, I don't know if my parents did anything with what I told them, but it is almost 100% likely that they did, because they are solid loving folks. To my knowledge, however, nothing ever came of it, and I never heard about any instances like that again. This happened when I was in my early 20s. In those days, I was working in a small sales office in my town. One of my hobbies is to travel alone. I really enjoy my freedom. In addition to the normal national holidays which my company offers, I would also travel on weekdays using my annual leave. People at work would ask me, where are you going this time? I would always reply with something like, that's a secret, but you'll find out when I bring in the souvenirs. I always brought back sweets or chocolates from wherever I went. I was never wary of telling people at work where I was going. I just kind of hate the advice that people give when they find out my destination. I want my own experience, you know? People would say, this place is good, or if you're going there, you gotta try this restaurant, or even make sure you check out this place. I didn't want all that, so I prefer to keep my holidays secret. So, the day of my holiday arrives, and I was on my way heading northeast on the expressway. Unfortunately, there was heavy traffic that day because of an accident up ahead, 
I was really disappointed as it was eating into my holiday. I restlessly looked around to switch into a faster lane. Since I didn't have much else to do, I looked in my side mirrors to see how far the traffic stretched behind me. I noticed something in my left-hand mirror two cars behind me. The driver of that car looked a hell of a lot like one of my male co-workers. The reason I suspected it was him was because he was, shall we say, unique in appearance and attitude. I mean unique in a slightly negative way. He also had a quirky haircut at the time, so he wasn't exactly hard to miss. I managed to get past the accident and felt like I didn't want to catch ice with the guy so I tried to keep the distance between our cars. I felt weird about seeing him going the same way I was going. As I kept driving, I thought that I might be overthinking things or being too self-conscious, but my initial fears were confirmed when I pulled into a rest stop and I saw my co-worker's car pull into the same place. I still thought that I could be overreacting, but I found it weird that he parked far away from my car. I went to use the restroom and to ease my mind, but I did keep an eye on his car. I was expecting him to come out of his car, but he didn't. When I came back from the bathroom, I glanced towards his car and saw him sat in the same position he was in when he arrived. It looked as if he never left his car. I felt as if there was something up in the pit of my stomach. I knew when I left the parking area, he would too. I could just sense it. I sat in my car for a full 10 minutes, but I didn't see him leave. My car was facing the only exit of the rest area. I decided to turn in my seat and check very quickly, and now there was no doubt. But how could I prove that he was following me? He might have been heading the same way as me, and might have needed a break when I needed one. It seemed unlikely, but not impossible but to give him the final shred of the benefit of the doubt and to satisfy my own curiosity. I decided that when I pulled out of the rest area, I would stop in the hard shoulder and make out that I needed to check my trunk was properly closed. When I saw him peel out behind me and I got a real good glimpse of him, I knew that it was the guy I worked with and I knew he was waiting for me to leave. I was pleased to see him go ahead of me and relieved to know that no one in my office knew where I was heading on my trip. About an hour passed, and I felt my shoulder blades unclench, and I began to relax a little, and as if to mock that feeling of security, his car pulled up behind mine. I began to tremble. Once I started to tremble, I felt as if it would never stop. I didn't know what to do. I just wanted to get away. You know that gut feeling that people always tell you to listen to? That was screaming at me at this point. I needed to take evasive actions. I was in the fast lane of the express highway, and I pulled all the way across to the other lane to peel out at the next exit, right at the last second. That way, he would not be expecting it. I had booked three nights away in two locations, but I decided to cancel my plans at the first location and go straight to the second. I just felt for sure that if he had followed me this far, then he might know where I was headed. I had to get back on the highway though, and I was scared. I sat in my car with the lights out down a dark lane and planned my route. I used the map app on my phone to make a route which would completely bypass the highway I assumed he was still on. To be honest, Looking back on it, I should have just gone straight home. I was looking over my shoulder the whole time. It wasn't exactly a relaxing break. I didn't see him again though, thankfully. When I got back to work, I checked the roster to see if he was supposed to be on holiday the same time I was. I mean, our office wasn't exactly Wall Street. There were just six employees. I had to schedule my holiday months in advance to get it authorized. It did not add up. I learned that he was on bereavement leave the same time I was on holiday. It was a really awkward situation to be in. I wanted to talk to someone at work about this, but I was also nervous since I was the only female employee. After some careful consideration, 
I took the plunge and told the director what happened. As I kind of expected, the director told me that he couldn't take my eyewitness statement as proof that my co-worker had stalked me. I remember the director saying, Hey, what do you want me to do? You're a single, attractive woman. And this happened off company property. I don't know what to tell you. In the following weeks and months, I tried my best to find other employment in my little town. We had our end of year party and I announced that I was leaving. It was a shame because if it wasn't for that creep, I might still be working there. But even though I knew he was following me deep down, I also doubted myself. I thought that it could have been a coincidence and that I could have been imagining things. I kept in touch with some people from my old workplace and I would often ask about the company. Anyways, six or seven years after I quit the company, I run into someone from those days and we get to talking. It turned out that the guy that followed me all those years ago was now in prison for breaking an entry and a crime so intimate and violent it shouldn't be mentioned. My blood ran cold when I heard that. I think that my gut feeling saved me that day. I am so glad. I cancelled my trip to the first hotel. It was about 28 to 29 years ago. It was about 28 to 29 years ago. After I graduated from high school, I got a job in Saitama. It's a prefecture in Japan which neighbors Tokyo. I got a second-hand car after a couple of months of moving to Saitama. You really need it out there. I was glad I bought one. I used to go on long, relaxing drives after work. I would listen to my music and smoke cigarettes. I really enjoyed it. Obviously, that was until the night in question. One night, I was on a particularly long drive. I was way out in the mountains. There wasn't much but darkness and the sound of cicadas all around me. I drove with the windows down. Well, at least one window. The driver's side window, since I was usually smoking. I was heading along this dark road, and I heard a scream. It wasn't an adult scream. It sounded like a kid's scream. It was blood curdling. I don't want to talk about it much because I can still hear it in my mind as I type these words, but trust me, if you heard something like that, you'd do what I did. Slam on the brakes. It was instinctive. I wasn't a believer in the paranormal or anything like that. I put a lot of faith into my five senses, and I felt like something was happening out here. So I pulled over onto the hard shoulder and got out of the car. I felt chills rise up my spine. It was the dead of night, and there was no reason why I should have heard what I heard. I scanned the area as best I could. My car's headlights lit up the dark woods ahead of me, but there was darkness in all other directions. I began to sweat. I was worried, scared, nervous, paranoid, you name it. I was overcome by some terrible dread. What made that sound? Was someone in danger? I was wondering. My legs began to tremble. I thought that was just a thing that people say, but it's pretty true. I couldn't hear anything apart from my heartbeat and the restless shuffle of my feet on the dirt road. I was panicked. I wanted to leave. I managed to convince myself that it was just an auditory hallucination. Maybe I was staying up too late or something. I didn't hear anything else after that initial scream, so I thought that I could just go. So I headed back home. About three weeks later, I was watching TV, and the same roads and the same mountain passes came up on the screen. The newscaster said the words, that I will never forget. Tsutomu Miyazaki has confessed to the murder and identified the scene of the crime to the authorities. The case 
had already proceeded to the courts, therefore I knew that the scream I heard was not happening in real time. Yet perhaps, it was some distant echo of the past. That scream wasn't one you'd hear in an amusement park, or if somebody startled someone. That was an end of life scream I saw on screen, the exact area I pulled over. It was truly disturbing to imagine what happened there. I didn't have to imagine because after the trial, weeks and months later, the guy's actions were very well documented by media and himself. If you don't want to sleep tonight, you can look up the crimes of Tsutomu Miyazaki, but I will not give him the recognition here. What he did truly turns my stomach. You'll understand why that scream scared me so much. I stopped going for night drives in the woods after that. This happened when I was studying abroad in the USA. I was in a homestay kind of situation. I made friends with a guy called John, who was a couple of years older than me. I ended up having a really great time hanging out with them. We would go shopping and play lots of video games. John also had a car. He drove me all over the place. John was really interested in Japan and Japanese culture. He would often ask me questions. He made me feel at home. It was one day during summer when he asked me, What do you do in the summer? Oh, you know, go swimming, eat watermelon, fireworks, and kimodameshi. What's kimodameshi? he asked. Oh, you know, you go somewhere scary, maybe a haunted location or something, and it's a test of your courage to see if you can stand going in there and exploring. That's your summer culture. That's awesome. I want to try that. I know a place too, he said. Oh, I don't know, John. Come on, man. I dare you, he replied. So that night we left the house at about 10pm. He said that there was an abandoned house about a 15 minutes drive away, and the reason why it was abandoned was unknown. John explained in the car that it looked completely fine, the building that is but the garden was overgrown. He said it gave off bad vibes. We parked up the car and approached the abandoned house with our mag lights. I remember that John held his SWAT style. He didn't seem to be scared of anything. He walked right up to the door and tried to push it open. But as you might expect, it was locked. John didn't seem phased. He started scoping out the perimeter. He was looking for windows. He found an open window, crept in through it in a matter of moments, and then arrived at the back door. He opened it for me and ushered me in. The house was really nice inside. I just kept thinking, why would anyone abandon this? Then I really started to get worried. Is this place really abandoned, I thought. I didn't want to make too much noise in there, just in case it was occupied. The place looked untidy, sure, but it did look lived in. I was really worried that someone was home. I wondered if it was just a property for sale and the owners were out of town until the sale went through or something. I mean, there were things in there. Things that you wouldn't want to leave behind. I thought for a second. It could be a house that a realtor shows to potential properties on a lot. Okay, where do we go now? John asked in a hushed voice. As soon as he asked this, I heard something. The spinning of a barrel. I stood there, completely shocked, as John shined his mag light slowly up the stairs. We heard a strange sound coming from up there. We heard firing. Then John shouted, Run. We were then running. I followed him out of the living room and through the back door. We ran out to the yard and back to John's car. A window burst open, and it was followed by that same horrible rattling sound. John threw open his door, and I hopped in the passenger seat. He sped off before giving me a chance to close the door. 
He gunned it. We must have broken some speed limits that night. When we pulled up in front of John's house, he regained his composure and he finally told me what had spooked him. There was a guy upstairs. In the time I knew John, I had never seen him afraid of anything, so I asked if that's why we had to run. It didn't seem like enough of a reason for me. He looked at me and said, Remember the weird noises. Unbeknownst to me, John was carrying his father's revolver. He pulled it out and popped out all the bullets, then began spinning the barrel. I recognized that sound to be the sound I heard from the second floor. Then he started pulling the trigger and it made the popping sound we heard earlier. The hammer sound chilled me to the core. I knew in that instance that someone in the house was trying to intimidate us by firing blanks. I said that if it was just blanks, it wasn't that bad. He looked me in the eyes and asked, Aren't you surprised that you heard the blanks as we drove off? We got out of the car and we saw a bullet hole in his trunk. Those were far from warning shots. Of course we never went back, but it was nice to share some Japanese culture with John. We go to these places in the summer to get the chills to beat the heat. I got more than I bargained for in America. This happened back in my university days, when a friend and I were on our way back from a trip. On the way back, I guess I must have misread the map or we took some kind of shortcut because we got lost somewhere on the mountain roads. My friend was driving and I was supposed to be the navigator. It was the one job I had. It was around 8pm, but it was already really dark since we were in the shadow of the mountains. I noticed a white truck up ahead. And I said to my friend, if we followed the truck, we would probably get back to a main road in no time. I thought it was a pretty sweet plan because I didn't have a clue where the hell we were, let alone what mountain we were on. We were tailing the truck for a while, and then we realized we were going further and further from the main road and further into the desolate mountain roads. We started to worry as the roads turned to dirt roads, one lane roads. The truck, more suited to these roads, sped up and we lost sight of it. It was weird and kind of unlikely for the truck to disappear all of a sudden. There was nothing ahead of us apart from dark, dirt mountain roads. It was playing on my mind, but our priority was getting back on a main road. I was flipping through a map with a torch held in my mouth. There was no cell phone coverage. We were going further down the road when I noticed some lights behind our car. I looked in the wing mirror and noticed a white truck behind us. It was the white truck we had been tailing. I told my pal what I'd just seen, and we both watched the truck in the mirrors. We began to get a little creeped out by this. The truck then turned its lights off. Is it even possible to navigate these winding mountain roads with the lights off? I wondered. It was getting really freaky now. I was nervous and I could tell that my friend was nervous too. I stated the obvious at this point. I think that truck from before is behind us, man. It's following us now. As soon as I said that, I began to sweat. My friend shifted nervously in his seat too. He sped up to test my theory, and the truck behind sped up to catch us. Still, with its lights out, we didn't know what to do. We began to argue about it. It was incredibly tense. Then suddenly, the truck behind us seemed to disappear. It felt totally hopeless. Whoever was in the truck clearly knew the roads. I really wish we didn't decide to follow that guy. We kept going forward on the one lane road, keeping an eye out for a chance to turn back, sending snappy, bitey remarks to each other about how we could get out of this mess. Then seemingly out of nowhere, the truck swerved into our lane again and slammed on its brakes. My friend reacted in time and once again we were behind the white truck. He said, if we don't do something, it's gonna end bad mate. This was the worst. I've never felt so stressed out. A moment or two later, we reached a point where the road got wider and my friend took his chance. We span into a U-turn. There wasn't too much space to turn, so my friend's car kissed the guardrail. 
On our escape, we noticed points in the road where the truck could have disappeared and appeared in front of us. That answered the question of how it was possible, but we still had the unanswered question of why. Why was this guy doing this to us? We knew that we were on our way back to civilization, so my friend floored it while I kept nervously glancing over my shoulder to see if the truck was following us. I kept asking him to speed up, but I knew that he couldn't. That truck could pop out of nowhere again at any moment. So we kept heading down those dirt roads until eventually they became concrete again. I saw the lights, lights of people's homes, and before long we came across a non-franchised gas station. My friend immediately pulled in and we skidded to a halt. My friend ran in and grabbed the clerk by his arm and frantically explained the situation. He asked the guy to call the cops and for directions to get off of these mountain roads. The clerk didn't seem that interested in our plea for help, so we got him to go outside. My friend then said, You have to believe us, there's some guy chasing us. Okay then, if a white truck with all its lights off turns up at any second, then will you believe us? And just as he finished saying that, the truck arrived with its lights still off. It screeched to a stop a few meters away from the gas station. Then, it slowly turned around and headed back into the darkness. We weren't able to get a look at the driver, but we noticed something. There was some sort of logo and some text on the side of the truck. The clerk at the gas station said, Oh, oh, <laughs> now I get you. The guy's from the church, huh? What? Oh, I say church, maybe cult's a better word. I pressed him for more information, and it turns out that apparently the entire mountain is their territory. They own a village, and the leaders and the followers all live there together. I understand that there are cults in Japan, but I didn't understand why that truck was following us. So I asked, and according to the old fellow at the gas station, there are frequent attempts to escape by followers of the cult who changed their mind. So the cult are very wary of cars getting anywhere near their village. Their reckless driving and relentless pursuits of anyone who gets close to the village is said to be the cause of numerous accidents up here in the mountains. I remember that the cult featured quite heavily on the news and in the media a few years after, but it seems to have gone radio silent since. I guess that guy who followed us was a lookout for escapees or for families trying to rescue their loved ones or something. It was a very creepy experience. Not too long ago, I went for a drive with some of my friends. We were driving around until late. It was also pretty foggy that night. It tends to be foggier in the mountains, and that's where we were. We wanted to go to the observatory area near the top of the mountain. I can't remember why we wanted to go. I realized that a jeep had started following us. It was coming up behind us really fast. One of my friends in the back pointed this out and requested in some colorful language for me to speed up. I was more than happy to do so. It was a Mercedes-Benz G-Class, which is the one that basically looks like a jeep. This thing was more suited to these mountain roads than my little car. It was really stressful with that behind me, and closing the gap with every second, plus the fog and my friends freaking out in the back. Luckily I spotted the turn for the observatory. I would soon be off of that road for that thing to pass, if that was indeed why it was tailing me. I turned and hoping the bends would keep going straight, but it didn't. I pulled in and it blocked the exit. I knew that whatever was going to come next wasn't going to be good. I sat in the driver's seat with sweat running down my forehead, telling my friends to keep calm and keep the doors locked. Agonizing seconds turned into minutes and a couple of figures emerged from the beds. We just sat there muttering to one another, pretending to be less frightened than we were. Finally, the two men approached us. They were wearing crisp and clean suits. They looked really professional. I guess that's the only way I can describe them. A slender man who wore glasses tapped on my driver's side window, and I lowered it by about 10 centimeters. 
What are you doing out here at this time of night? He asked very directly. We were just thinking of checking out the night view here, I mumbled. His friend, who looked in really great shape, snorted at this. Bunch of guys coming out here at this hour to look at a view on a foggy night, huh? These guys looked like they were part of the Yakuza. You know why we followed you, right? I shook my head. Come on, you guys driving around here. Up to no good, no doubt. We thought you might be one of us. Don't worry, you boys are alright. This is just a misunderstanding. There was a collective sigh of relief resonated in the car. We were at ease. We actually had a couple of cans of coffee from the vending machine together and had a chat and a smoke. I knew these guys were 100% Yakuza at this point. After a while, the guy with glasses said, We better get going. We have something we gotta do. They were perfectly nice guys. They got back into their car and I expected them to pull away. But they didn't. Their car just stayed there, blocking the only exit. We were starting to get nervous again. But then, after about three or four minutes, their engine started up and they disappeared from sight, going up the road into the mountains rather than back the way we came. I didn't know if there was anything up the mountain, but my business wasn't where they were going. I was just glad to be leaving. Now that we were pretty sure that we weren't about to have any conflict with the Yakuza, we began to laugh about the situation and tell one another how scared we were. Well, nearly all of us were laughing. One of my friends remained quiet and his face was pale. It was as if he'd seen a ghost. I noticed this and asked directly if he was okay. His reply shocked me. I, uh, I saw something. I pressed him to go on. The car was silent. When the big guy opened the back seat door, I got a glimpse of something inside the jeep. There was a guy with tape over his mouth and his arms behind his back. They were up to something. I know for a fact that there's nothing but empty forest land up in those mountains. None of us wanted to say what we thought was going to happen to the man, but I guess we were all thinking the same thing. I called the police, but without a license plate, I couldn't give them much to go on. I really don't know why my friend didn't memorize it if he saw the man in distress on the back seats. Nevertheless, be careful on the mountain roads at night. Hey guys, thanks for watching. Do me a favor and hit the like button and comment. Let me know what you thought of the video. Don't forget to subscribe as well, and hit the bell icon as well so you can stay notified whenever I release a new video. Now if you fancy checking out my channel memberships or Patreon, or any of my social media, all my links can be found in the description below. And as usual, I want to thank my patrons and channel members for supporting the channel. So a huge thanks to Sarah C. Linda, Austin, Tegan, Chris and Donna, Cassie Fowler, Pretty Girl 215, Christy, B Nick, Lil Smart, Do It, K, Something Edgy, Pretty Girl 215, Borderline Betty, Sarah C, Blazed Goddess, Christopher, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Lady Dracker, Sue, Absinthe Alice, Rochelle, Astara Ray, Monique, Crafty Kell, Monica Level Ace, Emma, Sean Gorman, Jennifer L, Skittles MM, Gabrielle, Serafina Nightingale, Jennifer C, Misanthropia, Fluby, Ryan, Brenda, Rudy, Christina De La Rosa, Noosh, Lulu Rogers, Fire 05, Linda, Shan, Jody, Sarah P, Kathleen Fenton, 
James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Alex, and Courtney Maxwell. I hope you guys enjoyed that and are doing well.